polls here in Minnesota close in just about a half hour, and all evening long we will bring you updates on all of our local races. There's also a continuous coverage live stream happening right now on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We hear some of the big races we are watching tonight, Minnesota Governor and Attorney General, as well as both of our Senate seats. There is also serious competition in several races for House seats in Minnesota. We want to welcome the political analysts that are joining us all evening long to offer their perspective on tonight's results. We have Catherine Tanucci, who is the former campaign manager for Governor Dayton. And we have Brian McClung, former deputy chief of staff and communications director for Governor Tim Pawlenty. We are so grateful for your time and insight tonight. There's going to be so much to talk about, lots going on in our mm -hmm. state. Let's start off, first of all, what appears to be could possibly be historic voter turnout for a midterm election in Minnesota. I'd love both of your thoughts. Let's start with you, Catherine. What could this mean for the candidates? This is always exciting news. Minnesotans are very good at voting. We have high turnout in almost every election. Um, really important in this race, of course. It, it's, 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 um, in 2016, we saw some things that we didn't expect, and there is a lot of people who hadn't voted in a long time, I think, turning out to vote for Trump. Now, the question today is whether those are the same people coming out or if we are seeing DFLers really energized and organized and turning out to vote for DFL candidates at the state and federal level, which is what I predict, actually. <laughs> and I think you're going to see voter turnout over 60 percent in Minnesota, which for a midterm will be the highest voter turnout since Tim Pawlenty was first elected in 2002 in what was a, a monumental midterm election when there was a, a new governor elected and a new U.S. senator elected. So but Republicans are really good voters and Republicans tend to vote in midterms and in presidential elections. So typically in Minnesota, some of that elevated turnout tends to be Democrats in a presidential election. So we'll see how that plays out when we get into those higher voter turnout numbers. And you look back, we did have high voter turnout in Minnesota two years ago and Republicans performed very well. Republicans picked up seats in the Minnesota House of Representatives and Donald Trump came very close to beating Hillary Clinton in Minnesota. So even with higher voter turnout, I think you're going to see Republicans perform very well. We have about a minute left in this cut-in before we have to send it back to NBC. Uh, 30 seconds each on the governor's race. What do we expect tonight, Catherine? Well, I think it's very important that the DFLers have a candidate in Tim Walls, who is from greater Minnesota. And so he will be capturing, um, I expect, higher turnout in rural parts of the state that has been favoring Republicans recently. I think that's going to drive up his total statewide. And and be a good night for, for Tim Walls, for governor. And it's kind of a north versus south thing because you have Tim Walls from the Mankato right. area. You have Jeff Johnson from Detroit Lakes growing up in northern Minnesota and, a, and an area that is becoming increasingly Republican. So I think Jeff Johnson is going to do very well, particularly in the 7th and 8th congressional districts. So we'll look for the voter turnout there and in the suburbs to see how that plays out. I think it's going to end up being a much closer race than people may have anticipated. And so it could be, it's Minnesota, so we tend to have recounts and long nights. So we'll <laughs> see if that happens again in the governor's race. Sure. All right. We're almost out of time, but does Minnesota play on the national stage? As in, we've seen the polls close on the East Coast. Tell us anything here yet or just way too soon? Well, it looks like it's kind of playing as to form. Democrats uh, look like they've picked up a seat in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., where Congresswoman Barbara Comstock mm -hmm. is projected to lose. So that spells some concern, I think, for Republicans in the suburbs. Minnesota, though, very important with four targeted congressional races. Fortunately, we have to cut awesome. you off there because we have to head it, uh, send it back to NBC. Polls are about to uh, close in Minnesota. In a half an hour, we'll be back.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Facebook Live. Welcome to Twitter. Welcome to YouTube. Here was our thought. We were going to kick this election coverage off and then we're going to toss the network, but we wanted to do something local that you can watch on your phone, you can watch it on your computer while you're watching NBC on TV. So we're bringing this two and a half hours of live coverage where, frankly, you can watch both at the same time if you'd like. I don't have to tell you how important this election is. Aside from the presidential race, we have seats for a seat for governor, two seats for U.S. Senate. We have a handful of House races that are super duper close. The fact that nationals are paying attention to Minnesota, I would say it's the most consequential election, at least in my lifetime. So we wanted to bring you these races from a local level and get you up to date coverage all night. So it starts right here. We have a panel of guests that are going to join us and talk about some of the most contentious issues, some of the reasons why they vote, some of the reasons why they thought it'd be a good idea to come into the TV station and tell us how they feel specifically about this midterm. We have our two experts we're going to get to later. So we have tons to cover and we have live shots all across the board at the biggest and tightest races that we have in the midterm. Let's start with Jana Shorter, Shortle, my goodness. My goodness. She's my co-host, the illustrious, the always fashionable. <laughs> Jana Shortle. <laughs> and tonight's no exception. So, Jana, take it away. Wow, what an introduction. Well, I brought six of my greatest friends here to talk about Minnesota elections. We all met, you know, about two and a half minutes ago. So I think we're on pretty good footing thus far. But this is important that we talk to the actual people, not just pundits, but who voted in Minnesota and why. But my first question, before I got to meet all of you, I want you to, you know, introduce yourselves, say who you are, where you're from, and anything else that you want to share. Just be courteous to your other panel members. Take about a minute to introduce yourselves and just tell me why you're here. John, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, so my name is John. I'm the chair of the College Republicans at the University of Minnesota, and I hope to represent all conservatives, not just those on college campuses and uh, those in Minnesota uh, here today. Um, I think it's important to get different perspectives. Um, we know that Minnesota might be purple. It's, the vote's still coming in. Um, so it's important to certainly um, have all perspectives here. Absolutely agree, John. Thanks for being with us tonight. We you. pass the microphone to Margaret. I'm Margaret Flower. I live in Hastings. The reason I'm here is I'm president of the Metro Republican Women. I'm also a past president of the Minnesota Federation of Republican Women, so I've been involved in Republican politics for a long time, understand the importance of voting, um, voted today and have voted for many years um, as a conservative. I've been a conservative. Um, I guess I, I feel that is the best for me, for my family, and would like to see some of the conservative values passed on to my children and grandchildren. Um, and I, I agree. I think this is one of probably I voted a long time, long time before you did. <laughs> oh, Margaret. <laughs> and, and it is probably the most important election I've voted in. And I think all of us agree to that. Well, thanks for making your way from Hastings to join us tonight. And I really like your nail polish. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Okay. Nancy, you are kind of the uh, team cheerleader here, and our, our mantra is be nice, and Nancy's going to wear that for all of us. Nancy, can you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Nancy Myhofer, and I'm from Shakopee, and I'm wearing my be nice shirt for two reasons, and that's because, number one, um, we, need to be, we need to be nicer, and uh, we need to be um, politically minded and careful what we say and what we do, and I am in the middle um, I've been voting that way for a while, and uh, the other reason I'm wearing my Be Nice shirt is it's for um, mental illness and everyone's journey in life is not the same, and uh, no life is perfect. So that's it. Thank you so much for being with us, Nancy. I yep. appreciate that. Renita. Hi. Hi, how are you? I am great, and Good. thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name's Renita. Um, I live in Burnsville, and um, I'm a proud Democrat. Um, I also consider myself one of the moms who came out of the shadows after 2016 okay. to become what we call ourselves super organizers and super activists. Um, we realized, um, I'm like most moms and friends that I know who were complete strangers, that we became activists together and started to really organize politically um, in the districts where we live. I'm in Congressional District 2. But my son was the big motivation for me to really step out from just being a voter to really being an engaged citizen. Um, and so tonight, I'm here to, to see where we go as a country because I'm all about how do we chart a path forward that says we're Americans. And, and do that better. And that's what tonight, that's what I'm looking for tonight. Awesome, thank you, Renita. Stacy. 
Hi, thanks for having um, me here. I am from Egan. I'm also a proud Democrat. Um, I'm a mom to three young girls, and I'm a teacher. And um, as a teacher, I feel like it's my job not to really teach my students what to think, but how to think and to listen to one another and to be kind to one another awesome. um, and to look at every issue from both sides. So I'm just really excited to be a part of this and to hear lots of different perspectives and to have some good civil discourse. So. Excellent. Kevin, we'll round it out with you. Nice vest, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Murphy. I am an honorably discharged disabled American veteran. I live in Chaska. Uh, I am an independent. I have voted for both sides. I vote for who I think is going to do best for our country. Um, sounding like a panel of good people. I've been out on the campaign trail. I was Bob Anderson for U.S. Senate campaign manager, and I met people where civil discourse, disagreeance is fine. I'll sit with somebody all night long and have a civil discussion and possibly get swayed. But I don't like what's going on on both sides. I don't like seeing physical violence. That's the last resort. And hopefully the six of us tonight can make something come of this in the Minnesota political situation. And thank you for having me. Well, it is an honor to have all of you totally different perspectives and totally different lives that you lead here in Minnesota, but you are all Americans and you are all Minnesotans and you're super engaged for all really, really, really good reasons. I wanna talk a little bit about what Kevin and Stacy you hit on a little bit and about civil discourse. Can you talk a little bit about, and I'll just randomly pick uh, Nancy, we'll start with Be Nice Nancy. Why? How have we lost our way? When did we lose the ability to engage with each other in a civil manner? Um, I can say that in one sentence when the word the wall came up. I feel like we have built walls of hate and um, it makes me sad that we don't even hear about um, Every, every time there's um, gunshots, we don't even hear about it anymore because it's commonplace, and that just makes me sad. Okay. Margaret, I would give this, this question then to you. Nancy brings up the wall. That is something that President Trump ran on, and you identify as a Republican. What's your reaction to that? I guess I never thought of, I mean, I think she's referring to the wall in other other issues also. Oh, uh, with you, metaphor. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm more of a metaphor rather than... <laughs> All right, this, let's go wall metaphor. <laughs> with a wall metaphor, and I'm, quite frankly, I never thought of it that way. Sure. Uh, she does bring up an interesting point that, you know, we have built a metaphor wall. I mean, I'm not referring to the, the wall on the border. I'm referring to, uh, and, and I, I agree with her, you know, we, we have become so we don't, like you say, we hear gunshots and we don't even know what happens. Yeah. All these things happen and, and they become commonplace. And, and I hadn't thought of it, but it is actually an interesting thought to, that there is a wall between us and all mm. these other things too. John, mm. from the youth perspective or from the younger perspective than me, <laughs> um, what do you make of that? I mean, what, what are you hearing, you know, in your age group, I guess? Well, um, for young conservatives on college campuses, um, we know that we're, we're harassed a lot, just, and, and that's a lot of the hate comes from, comes from the Democrats, comes from the left, because what really happened, I don't think it was the wall, there was a moment at some point in time, maybe not in one day, but over a course um, of time, that we stopped thinking of the other side as just stupid and started thinking of them as evil. You know, we used to just think the other person was less informed or didn't do their homework. And now we think that they're evil and they're out to get us. And the words that come with it, like, like Trump's a racist, you know, that, that's not a conversation starter. It's a conversation ender. Like, you can't go from that. And, and the, there's, like, the big three. There's racist, sexist, and xenophobic. And I hear these a lot come, come from the left. Don't forget the Islamophobe. Islamophobe as well. But there's, I'm, I'm sticking with the big three. We could go on for a while now. Um, and we just hear these so much, and, and, they, and they shut down discussion. They don't. Uh, so how do we open up discussion? Because one of the first things you just said is that there's harassment coming to Republican young people, sure. but not talking about what could happen to other people yeah. on other sides of the aisle. Right. Well, well, the first step would be is to realize that that kind of language is not constructive. Fair. Like whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you're not. If you really think someone's racist, like we talk about the wall, I don't think the wall 
And I don't think illegal immigration is a race problem. I don't think it has to do with race. I think it has to do with national sovereignty. But this issue has been painted so brilliantly by the Democrats as being about race and being about that these people are brown and we don't want them here. I was saying last night on the radio that these people could be coming down from Canada with their Crown Royal and their Oilers jerseys. And if, if they're committing crime, and if they're bringing opi opioids, and if they're taking tax dollars from health care and benefits, then it, it's the same issue. It's, I, have this, I would have the same grievances um, when it comes to it. But you know, the conversation can't get started because apparently I'm a racist because these people don't have the same color of skin as I do. So. All right, so you bring up you know, many of the divisive topics, and we can get into that, but we want to always just keep focusing on, on what Minnesotans are feeling and thinking. And right now, one of the interesting things, I'm sure you have all heard the national pundits say Minnesota is on stage right now. They're looking at those congressional races and looking at us to see where that tips Congress. And we'll get to that. But I really want to know, too, and think about this, what drove each of you to the polls? Was it one issue like health care or immigration or education or what happens to your family? And, and think about what we can talk about with that. But until we, we're going to have to pitch it back to Chris here for a little bit, and then we'll do that in the next half hour. But I thank you for your candid answers and your introductions. And if you have questions for anybody on our panel, feel free to chime in on Facebook. We'll try to get those on, too. But, Chris, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Jana. Um, Brian McClung, former Deputy Chief of Staff, Governor Pawlenty, Catherine Tanucci, former campaign manager for Governor Mark Dayton. Can I first just say that that was awesome? Like, <laughs> like seriously, having that panel here in nice studio to hear. Nice to hear. is something I really hope that viewers at home mm -hmm. will grasp onto and chime in, which you have. We're getting um, what appear to be dozens of comments right now. And we'd like to invite your questions. You can hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, on care11.com, and on YouTube. This is a two-way communication, and we're happy to break down any questions that you have. So let's just get that. That was awesome. Well, and I think Catherine and I would agree that was one of the things we b both enjoyed working for governors, right? And working for a Republican governor, working for a DFL governor. Governors in Minnesota are very approachable. And when you're yeah. out in public, people come up to the governor and talk to them and engage and have real conversations. Right. And that was fantastic. And always, yeah. almost always, very respectful conversations and wanting to share their own stories and talk about where they're from, their life experiences. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think that's something that Minnesotans are known for. I know we're kind of going through a tough time politically right now and it seems very divisive, okay. but I know having worked for governors of different parties, that's something that we had an opportunity to experience back during those days. Well, I'd point out too that um, Brian and I worked for governors of different parties, but we work together now and are friends now and we talk about this stuff How's that every going? day. Are you guys we talk okay? about it every day. We're okay. We're you good. Fight? We <laughs> no, no, no. We are right. we're good. good. We um are are like trying to learn how to debate some of these big issues yeah. and disagree about stuff and certainly, you know, compete to win. Like I'm I'm supporting my candidates, he's supporting his candidates, but at the end of the day, like we want we want to work together. So like let's start with that question first. If anybody's been following politics in the last six years, the last couple decades, it feels like right now the heat has turned up about 800 degrees right. and it's so divisive and the rhetoric rhetoric is, sh is so sharp that it's hard to communicate which is why again we appreciate the panel coming in can you compare what it's like now as an environment and as a, as a political temperature to what it was like when you guys were, were well running and the shows? part of it is that it's also so much more immediate right and so when i was the governor's communications director during his 2006 re-election twitter hadn't been invented yet sure and so we didn't have that kind of instant and instantaneous feedback loop and that sense that everybody was kind of coming at one another with an opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it though is there's a research report done recently by a group called More in Common that showed that it's really about 14% of Americans that are making all the noise. It's about 8% of people on the left and about 6% of people on the right. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who vote all the time, who give money, who are online. And so it's really about 14% of people that are generating all the heat. Well, and then you... about 70% of people who are just exhausted and tired of it. So it feels like it is very aggressive. It feels like it's everyone. It's really not everyone. It's really kind of a subset of people who are you know, more involved and more engaged, and that's what you're seeing. So you're saying loud minority, silent majority, yeah. and that social media gives people this megaphone to, like, hate? 
Yeah, I mean, the social media piece, it's just constant, right? And yeah, it's like everyone it. gets to publish their opinion mm -hmm. literally 24-7. Now, that's both really awesome and really difficult. Like, the beauty of it is we're able to engage in conversation with people that we might not talk to mm -hmm. otherwise, that we know just from Twitter. I've got Twitter friends that I chat with that I, I don't know, maybe have never met in real life. So that's the cool piece, but it also, I mean, it's, it's, it's two-sided and it also just makes it um, really easy to say we know it's easier to say mean stuff online when you're kind of behind a screen it's and amazing. it is so I've been I spent the day yesterday and today texting voters encouraging them to get out and vote and yeah. support a particular campaign and it was really fun like I got a lot of awesome feedback that was like yes I voted yes I'm going to vote but and then I got a lot of <laughs> really awful, obscene, stuff that like you don't hear when you're door knocking like because people are generally polite face to, to face. your face. But it's the it, shroud of anonymity. It, it's really, it can be really, really yeah. harmful. How about some election stories? It's something else I wanted to talk to you guys about. <laughs> What's it like when you're sitting there with the candidate and you're looking for the feeds to come in and the polls have closed and you're just waiting for a check mark or waiting for defeat? What is that like in that time? Yeah, so you kind of you go through an exercise of kind of outlining some key precincts that you're going to look at and what numbers you expect to hit. Mm -hmm. And so for us in 2006 in Governor Tim Pawlenty's re-election campaign, we were particularly looking at Rochester and Olmstead County. We felt like we needed to overperform and do better there. In the 2002 election, former Democrat Congressman Tim Penny had run as an Independence Party candidate, and he was from that area, so he had done well. So we were looking at places like Rochester in 2006 and other places around the state to see how we were doing. But it was a nail biter. I mean, in, in October of 2006, we were behind in virtually every poll. I think pretty much in every poll. So we were going into election day just hoping that we could press through and somehow come up with a win and ended up winning by one percentage point, oh winning by uh, 24,000 votes. And again, that was in a really big turnout for a midterm. So there were about 2.3 million votes cast wow. and we won by 24,000 votes. But, uh, in, the, yeah, in 2010, right? we were doing the same thing. We were just watching different parts of the state, right? So we were watching places that have traditionally high DFL turnout. Yeah. And so we're looking at Duluth and the Iron Range and we had Here's a story for you. We had a, it was a volunteer campaign advisor. So this was not one of our paid consultants, but this was someone who was advising the campaign. He was looking at the numbers coming back, and he goes, you're going to lose. He told us in, in, in the election night, it was about 5 o'clock in 2010, you're going to lose. The turnout's terrible. Duluth in the range. I think Oberstar is going to be fine, but you guys are going to lose. Well, it ended up being the opposite, and Congressman Oberstar lost his seat, and we won. And so sometimes so who fired you, you that need guy? to yeah again He's volunteer. volunteer. He, can't fire him. he was a friend. <laughs> it didn't Leave go the room, great. Please, sir. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, he was not allowed in in 2014. So. Bad juju. That's <laughs> yeah. no good. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, another thing I want to talk about is the issues. It seems like certain issues, perhaps. Uh, more than a lot of the elections that I've covered are really propelling people to the polls. Whether it's you have a, a knack for immigration and you feel very strongly about that, or it's pre-existing conditions in healthcare and the lawsuit against uh, the Affordable Care Act. These are huge things that uh, you know we can see turn very quickly if one party rules the presidency in, in all of Congress. So what do you think are the key issues that Minnesotans care about? And are they the same as the national issues? Yeah, I mean, I think they generally are. I think it's health care, immigration, and the economy are mm -hmm. the top three. Education is probably in there for Minnesotans as well. And I think on health care, the divide is, do you want health care to be more government involved? Do you want it to be more government run? Or do you think there should be more competition? We should try to open up the marketplace. And mm -hmm. that's basically what it comes down to. Democrats have seized on the idea that Republicans would make sure, would take away coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. That's not my understanding of it, but that's certainly become a major theme in the campaign, and Republicans have tried to push back on that idea. When, on immigration, that is an issue that particularly for Trump voters is really important. And so for Republicans who are trying to motivate and energize those voters from 2016 to come back and vote again, when they, they voted in the presidential election, they might not vote in the midterm. Yeah. Immigration is really important to them, so they're using that issue to try to motivate the Republican base in particular. And then on, on the economy and jobs, the economy is doing very well, right? Unemployment is very low. People feel pretty good about their jobs. But it doesn't seem to be translating 
to support for Republicans down ballot necessarily. Trump is getting some credit for the economy, but we're seeing in polling that they're not giving that credit all the way down ballot to other Republicans. Mm. So it is generally, I think, those issues, those same issues that we're seeing. And those are the, and in part, those are the issues. We know that they're polling well because those are the issues that are showing up in TV ads, and nobody's going to spend millions of dollars on TV ads until they know what message is going to move voters. Or hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> right. right. Things what are a think? little bit different at the state level. The issues are a little bit different for people who are, are thinking about who to vote for for governor mm. or for their state representative, for example. And the issues, I think, driving those races are, are typically, and in this case, education. Um, governor Dayton has been a great governor for, for making investments in education, but a lot of parents feel like we can do better. A lot of people feel like we can do better for our kids. And so... Um, they're looking at education as an issue. Transportation infrastructure is a huge issue at the state level. And it's a thing that has, it's very difficult to do because it's incredibly expensive to invest in roads and bridges to fix what needs to be fixed and make things better. But it's something that everyone can relate to. Yeah. And so it's something that people want to see the governor and the legislature act on. It's something that we've seen polling that a majority of Minnesotans would support raising their own gas tax if they knew that would make for better roads and bridges. Right, it's kind of like yeah. uh, uh, proximity. How close are you to problems, right? I mean, we're right. not on the southern border, we're on the northern border. We're not on the southern right. border, so you'd think something like schools would be a, a bigger play for, for voters here. Uh, and that's something that comes down to the, to the governor's race. I mean, that's something they split on health care is what you talked about. Uh, I believe, let's see, Walls supports like a public buy-in. So he supports a Minnesota care, which is kind of what you're hearing on the left at the national level. And then uh, Johnson wants to continue to protect pre-existing conditions, but he wants competition. And that's another Republican theme that you keep hearing to control costs. We have about a minute before we're going to toss it back to Jana, but I mean, it's interesting, right? It, it sort of parallels the national stream. Yeah, there. and I know Jeff Johnson had a doctor from Canada who has moved to Minnesota come and talk about, well, we had a government-run system in Canada, and let me tell you, it doesn't work so good. You have to wait a long time. You, you come in, you don't get an MRI when you need it, and it is extraordinarily expensive. So that's the case that Republicans have tried to make is, they say it's something might be free or it's simple. It's not free or simple. Mm -hmm. Under Obamacare, your health care premiums have gone up significantly. So let's not double down and have even more government control over our health care. He's also, or Jeff Johnson as a candidate, has also promised to look at cuts to every area of the state budget. So it's impossible to see how he could protect people who need health care because they have a pre-existing condition. Anyway, it, 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 we have seen it play out. It's an incredibly challenging, huge issue. It's the biggest piece of the state budget and um, yeah. something that people need. Was that the first like political debate we just had? <laughs> <laughs> you got a little Maybe you so. got a little right, you got a little left <laughs> there. Maybe more to continue. All right, we're gonna toss this over to Jana right now who has a little bit more before we go back to Randy and Julie. So let's give it back to you, Jana. Chris, thanks a lot. We do have a live panel here with six very different Minnesotans with very different views on the state of politics in our state. And we're going to keep this discussion going on our social media pages, Facebook Live. So if you have any questions for these voters, remember, they're not politicians. They're voters just like you. Feel free to chime in with those and we'll get to as many of those as we can. You can join the discussion, as we said, on Facebook Live. It is going right now, but at this time, we will send it back to our team.
Good evening again, everybody. The polls in Minnesota are closing in less than five minutes, and we do know we have record-breaking voter turnout. Soon we're going to begin to get some firmer numbers on what's going on tonight in our local races. But first, let's take a live look at the DFL election night party at the Intercontinental Riverfront Hotel in St. Paul. And the Republicans are hoping to be celebrating tonight at the Doubletree in Bloomington. Crowds will be gathering throughout the night in both locations. We want to start out uh, with our two guests tonight, uh, Catherine Tanucci and Brian McClung, who've uh, been gracious enough to join us to talk a little bit about what we can expect tonight from both sides. We saw live pictures from both uh, locations. What do you think, Catherine, about the DFL tonight? What can we expect? I think the reports that we're hearing on record turnout is making DFLers very excited. I think they're gonna have a great party tonight. Lots of reasons to celebrate. Seeing the early vote totals come in at record numbers for a midterm election, and then hearing stories of people um, of precincts just overperforming for a typical midterm election in really important DFL areas like Minneapolis and near the college campus in St. Cloud. That's, that's uh, making DFLers very enthusiastic right now. Hmm. And Brian, what about the Republican side? Well, we have, this is a once in a generation opportunity for Republicans to control state government. So Republicans have control of the Minnesota House right now. There's one seat that is uh, in the running to control the Minnesota Senate, but it's in a very Republican district. And if Jeff Johnson can get elected governor, Republicans would have control of the entire state government for the first time since we had partisan designation of the legislature <laughs> in the early 1970s. So that is very important. And we're also looking really closely at the first congressional district and the 8th Congressional right. District. Those have been held by Democrats, but those are both open seats right now. Those are districts that Donald Trump won by 15 points each. So if we can flip those, that would be a great sign. That would be a key part of Minnesota's scene for Republicans tonight. And you were saying as well that first district, you, you have to have that first district if you want to win the governor's seat, correct? Because the population numbers, if you don't get that, well, it's really important for Republicans to do well down yeah. there, especially in the southwestern part of the of the state, in that western part of the first congressional district. So that is important. Now, Tim Walls is from there, mm -hmm. um, and it's been a really close race between Dan Feehan and Jim Hagedorn down there in the first congressional district. So we'll see what those number, how those numbers play out. I think Walls had an advantage in some earlier polling, but Jeff Johnson had closed the gap. So. We'll watch. I think the first district is going to be really important as part of the whole statewide package. And just a quick thought. We have about 30 seconds left, Catherine. No party has held the governor's governorship for more than two terms. Right. In, in my memory, it's been two terms at the most. For Governor Plenty, served two terms as Republican. Governor Dayton, yeah. two terms as Democrat. This will be unprecedented. This will be unprecedented in recent history anyway. If Walls, wins. if Walls wins tonight to serve three terms with DFL governor in the, in the governor's office. All right, well, polls will be closing in about 45 seconds. If you're in line at the polls, of course, you're asked to stay in line. You will be able to vote. But the next time we see you at 826, we'll hope to have some early numbers coming in. We'll share all those results with you and have more analysis coming up in about half an hour. But for now, we'll send it back to NBC election night coverage.
Go ahead. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> We're going to continue our conversation with Catherine Tanucci and Brian McClung, both of whom have very recent behind the scenes uh, experience at these high level campaigns in our state. So we're, we're really thankful to have them here at the table with us to continue the conversation. Hopefully we can widen out so you can actually see them. That's yeah, fantastic. there they are. Thanks yeah. guys. Look at that slow reveal, huh? <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> and talking about dramatic tonight, it is really uh, exciting and inspiring to see so many people going to the polls. It is hard to tell though, uh, who they're voting for obviously, because you were talking about Republicans are, are known as people who show up at the polls and you were saying Catherine that the where they're showing up to vote in big numbers like Minneapolis maybe by the U of M campus shows us maybe they are uh, more liberal leading voters so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Well and what's interesting to watch too in part is this divide between greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities mm -hmm. and we saw that really start to play out during the last election cycle. Republicans have been particularly strong in greater Minnesota and so I think there are um, about a half dozen seats that Donald Trump won the district that Democrats control in the Minnesota House of Representatives. So those are continued targets for Republicans. So that's where Republicans are playing offense. And those are all in greater Minnesota. And then there's about a dozen seats that Hillary Clinton won that Republicans control. And most of those are in the suburbs. So we'll see. Democrats need to pick up uh, 11 seats to take control of the Minnesota House. Mm -hmm. And as I was working on my scorecard tonight, I could see some places where Democrats are likely to win some seats. And they typically do make some gains when you have the other party in charge of the White House. But I cannot get all the way to 11 seats. Mm -hmm. So I look at that and I think that Republicans have enough strong incumbents, people who have been through tough reelections, that they are going to hold on to control of the Minnesota House. They might even pick up some seats in greater Minnesota, which would continue that kind of metro greater Minnesota split that we've seen mm -hmm. happening in the legislature. And I don't know how this ties into that conversation, but there was something that struck me when we talked on a conference call a couple of days ago that you said, or one of you said, about women decide elections. I think you said that. When you see the big turnout from Minnesota today, what does that tell you about women voters in this state and what that might mean to all of the local elections? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this. I'm, women are a key demographic in most elections and women in the suburbs, especially college educated moms, are often swing voters or independent minded voters. Um, but since 2016, we have seen on a national level and a local level, anger and um, inspiration from women on a, on a whole new level, like nothing we've seen before, or not for a while, maybe since women were marching for the right to vote, right? Yeah. And so I am encouraged by um, stories of, of high turnout, again, in the metro, in the suburbs, expecting a lot of women who are, you know, maybe not as engaged, but are feeling engaged because they feel like this really matters because yeah. they have a lot of anger at Trump. They have a lot of anger about things that have happened on the national level and are turning out. Women are running. And actually, this is good news, too. I think that women uh, Republicans, they have uh, more women candidates than ever before in House races. And so um, it's just it's exciting to see at every level women engaged in the process more as we keep marching towards yeah. equal representation at every level of government. All right. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks again for your insight, guys. We'll be back with more from Brian and Catherine in a moment. For now, though, let's go to Chris Harapsky, who's in the newsroom with more coverage. Hey, Chris. Hey, Julie, Randy, thanks for tossing it over. So we're going to continue the Facebook Live right now by introducing you to the gubernatorial candidates. We're going to talk about the U.S. Senate races uh, that we have in the election in this midterm. And we're going to check in with a little social media from each of those candidates. So we're talking about the governor's race right now. Republican Jeff Johnson dropped this. I believe this was this morning, right, B? This morning. Dropped a little hashtag momentum is what he said. Walls was pretty active on social media as well. Uh, he said, backward all started. So this is out of, this is out of Mankato. He said, the Mankato campaign office. He says, I'm so grateful to the folks from the first congressional district who have stood with me since 2006. We are hashtag one Minnesota. And that's interesting, too, because, I mean, he left that first congressional district uh, after being there for a number of years and obviously running for governor now. Was, I think we have two more here. What else were they doing today? Here's Jeff Johnson. He says, this campaign doesn't take one second off until the polls close. Giving a shout out to some of his staff there. Uh, making calls. Oh, that's the Lieutenant Governor candidate. That's what it was. And Tim Walls. Yeah, okay. Let's give a little bio on them before we go out to the headquarters here. Walls, a football coach. 
He's obviously with the DFL. He's a football coach. He's veteran Minnesota National Guard, which is a big play for, for a lot of voters. He's a teacher from Mankato. Uh, like I said, multiple-term congressman from the 1st District in southern Minnesota, Rochester, Mankato. And I actually remember covering Walls. It was the... Uh, it was the, uh, his very first debate when he was first running against uh, Representative Gil Gutnick down in the 1st Congressional District. And Gutnick was there for, man, I don't know, it was like six or eight different terms. And I remember that debate vividly at the PBS station down in Austin. And he won that race. Um, let's talk about Jeff Johnson, though, if you want to pull up a Johnson tweet here real quick, B. Sure. Uh, so he was born and raised in Detroit Lakes. He went to Georgetown Law, so he's a Georgetown Law grad. Uh, he's a Hennepin County commissioner. He's a business owner, founded Midwest Employment resources and uh, he spent six years as a state representative so those are your candidates for governor and we also want to talk about some US Senate stuff too so before we do that though let's just toss it to the live shot let's go out to John Croman and Kent Erdahl who are live at the DFL headquarters to give us a little bit of a taste as to what's happening over there is people getting excited or what uh, yeah, the people are starting to filter in. Uh, they're, they're kind of excited with the early returns. Right now we're competing sound-wise with the sounds of uh, MSNBC on the big TVs here. Um, but they're, well, they're liking most of the stuff they're seeing up on the monitors, Kent. Yeah, these election headquarters really are dead every election year until about 8 o'clock when the polls close. Then everyone starts flooding in, and that happened. But there's been a lot of actual cheers here already because... MSNBC projected Amy Klobuchar winning her race, right, so people right. cheering people here. here. We're, we expect right. to hear from her relatively soon. Yeah. That's That was the one that everyone kind of expected to hear from her first, right. and I think we'll be hearing She was soon. way ahead in the polls, so that would make sense, I guess. Right. And, um, you know, right now the podium, uh, the lectern behind us is empty, but we can switch to a shot that gives you a better idea of what the crowd looks like. Uh, they're uh, over there, a lot of them uh, stopped by the bar first and got their drinks, <laughs> which it helps, I guess, on a night like this. I'm not endorsing alcohol. We're not endorsing it. I'm neutral on alcohol. Um, and uh, but uh, yeah, it's, the, the mood here is pretty good so far. The night is really young. Um, we know that. You know, it's interesting, Chris. We talked to Ken Martin, chairman of the DFL, uh, prior to everyone kind of getting here tonight. He he said, you know, despite encouraging numbers, statistics, all of that, uh, uh, a night for the DFL here, right. projecting that. Uh, because of 2016, because of everything else, really didn't want to get too excited at all. It was really pretty deadpan the whole way. Uh, uh, just talking about the fact that they wanted to get a final push uh, at the polls, get everyone out, get right. the vote out, and uh, not take anything for granted tonight. So it'll yeah, be an interesting yeah. one. He didn't want to be one of those people who, you know, one of those running backs who like spikes the ball at the two yard line and has an early, you know, a celebration and then this. It's recovered is not really a touchdown. So you, you didn't want to take anything for granted. They wanted to run all the way through. And they said something like two million. They made two million individual contacts in the last few days, which is just incredible. Because some people think that'd be a good number just for the entire election cycle. Yeah. They did that again, recontacted people again in these last few days. So that was a pretty remarkable. And they're really proud of that stat. Whether that stat translates the votes, you know, we don't know. Hey, yet. John, can, can I ask way, you a question? Sure. Sure. Can I chime in? How yes, is yes. ABC calling Amy Klobuchar right now? We just checked Secretary of State's website, and they have like 0.17 reporting. So how how are they able to project that so early? The I think they closed, must have they must have like uh, exit key, polling, exit polling, or key people and key precincts or just knowing. I mean, they, there's a science to this. Um, I don't have access to their science. You don't have I, I guess they do. <laughs> and you don't so, have access to the science. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, he, I'm going to. <laughs> he doesn't have access to the science, but he's getting pretty good at this color commentary. I think we know that John's trying to make a, a pitch to the sports department once the election wraps up. That's right. So he can maybe get some reps in there. And speaking of color, um, the, you know, we knew that Walls was in the building because all of a sudden these people start showing up with the red plaid shirts, which is kind of his signature look. He, he, he's been wearing that the entire race, and his supporters showing up tonight in their red plaid. There's probably a shortage of red plaid shirts at Mills, Fleet Farm, and other places, I'm guessing. Uh, Wouldn't you guess? Um, but, uh, it's Minnesota. I don't, it's, I don't it's, think it's so. Minnesota, it's Minnesota, but it, a shortage. It's, it's part of the look. So, um, And then you notice something over there. We can't really see it because the crowd's blocking it. But Ice sculpture. An ice sculpture. And what was your comment on the socials about I'm that? wondering, with some of these tight races coming up, and we'll talk about the Attorney General's race, of course, because that's the one I think everyone expects to go down to the wire. What happens first? Do we have a winner 
or do we have a puddle of water right. from the ice sculpture? Yeah. That it could be a race well, of the clock, like, Chris, and we could be here throughout until well, the I'm sure you, Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> you. It's like one of those. Well, thank um, you guys. And, and, I, I appreciate yeah. uh, being able to check in with you guys on Facebook, YouTube, and social media here. We're going to dump away from you guys for now. Stay put. We'll probably come back to you later, if uh, depending on who wins any of these races. But what I'd like to do right now is swing over to the GOP headquarters where Carla Halt is, and we can kind of check in on some of those races here. We wanted to talk about the gubernatorial race and some of the big U.S. Senate races right there. Uh, Carla, how are things going over there? Well, they're going well. It's obviously really busy and active and very loud at this point. Chris, I want to put the microphone out. The party is definitely beginning. They've been cheering intermittently and sometimes booing if they don't like the results that have been showing up on the screens behind me. I just had Jeff Johnson, the gubernatorial candidate for Republicans, beside me. He had to go. He is awaiting results, obviously, on his key race. And that is one of the key races, of course, that the whole party is watching. They are hoping that Jeff Johnson, the Hennepin County Commissioner, is able to pull off a victory against Tim Walls. They're hoping his message about limiting government spending and lowering taxes resonates with voters. At this point, it's looking like it's an uphill battle for him, but it is still a close one and one to watch. In addition to that, of course, the big Senate showdown between Tina Smith, the Democrat, and Karen Housley, the state senator, who is hoping to win that special election for Senate. She's hoping that she's able to really plug into, tap into that pro-Trump mentality. And in fact, that reminds me, Chris, of what I had talked about with the chair of the Republican Party of Minnesota. Earlier tonight, she said, hey, this really great voter turnout will benefit Republicans. And she said, this isn't a referendum on the president, as many people have been saying. This will be affirmation of the president and specifically how he has performed these first two years. So they are hoping for good results. They think that the high voter turnout will help them. Other key races to watch, of course, all of those congressional races, specifically the first, the second, the third, the eighth, those two metro races involving Jason Lewis and Eric Paulson. Expect those to be nail biters and down to the wire as well. But again, a lot of folks here, they're wearing the red and, and they're hoping for a party. Yeah, it, look, it looks like a party over there. Carla Hall, yeah. thank you so much. You're talking about the first congressional district. I heard that's one of the closest races in the nation. And we're going to talk to our reporter, Danny Spiwak, who's down there a little bit later in this Facebook Live uh, broadcast. So for now, let's toss it back over to Janice Shortle, who has our... We're at pins and needles over here, just waiting to get in on this conversation. This panel has come from far and wide in the state of Minnesota to talk about issues that are important to them. So about 40 minutes ago, we wrapped up talking about uh, di just divisions and something that we're seeing all over this country. And so, Renita, you wanted to talk about that. And so what would you have to say? Um, I was so excited that you asked the question around division. Um, I think we talked a little bit about the role of social media but and how that plays into the division that we see today. But I think it's also important to know that even the division exists even within families, okay. at schools, it's where you work. So I think it has had a role to play in the division, but I also understand that we have to look forward to what happens next, what happens the day after today, what happens tomorrow, how do we move forward? Um, and so as, as I just wanted to bring my perspective to the conversation to talk about what I've been seeing on the ground um, okay. as a Democrat, and as a volunteer, I had a gr I've had the awesome opportunity of volunteering for an organization um, that's got that brings together Republicans and Democrats. And we talked a little bit about how do we come to, in the middle? How do we find common ground? And how do we get to that place? And and we have had, I think, phenomenal conversations. And the way we've done that, even though we've had divides, has been about listening. Mm. We started to listen and get to know each other, and to start to see each other as human again. I believe when we start to talk about differences, when we talk about politics, we start to dehumanize each other. And you know, you are seen as enemies. And at that point, we are no, no longer able to have conversations. So I, I, I am thrilled to be able to say that I've been able to make friends both sides of the aisle, whether they're red or blue, but because we've learned to le understand each other. And I believe 
coming together at that at that level and getting to know each other personally has helped to break down the walls that we talked about and in sense that has then allowed us to then have conversations about issues how we find how do we move forward to have conversations about solving the big ticket problems because at the end of the day we all want the same things we want the same things for our kids and our families um, we all want jobs we all want those big ticket items whether you're red or blue um, we just have to find a way to say how can I listen and get to know you better and then let's start to have a conversation about where can we agree on some things and learn to listen and not treat each other's enemies. Renita, I like what you're cooking. It smells good. <laughs> Which brings me to a question that we wanted to put out um, to you uh, on our megaphone. And that question is, do you feel good after you voted today? Do you feel good about the state of our nation right now? And we want you to just say yes or no. Is that something that you feel good about? You went out and you did your civic duty. You've talked to your friends and neighbors. You've heard all sides and you got to cast your vote. You don't have to listen to the ads anymore or the pundits or the news anchors. You got to decide for yourself. And so go ahead and vote on that. We'll keep that up for a while. Stacy, I wanted to ask you kind of pegging off of what Renita was saying about having that kind of rhetoric because you mentioned you're a school teacher. And so while those kids probably are too young to vote right now. They won't always be. Mm -hmm. Are we setting a good example for them? Um, unfortunately, I don't think we are right now, in, um, especially in the media and as leaders, like John was talking about. I, I think often we use language that's not kind. Mm -hmm. And then we use language that, instead of starting conversations, ends co um, conversations and puts up those walls. And so that's something that we really, really work on like as part of our curriculum in school nowadays is listening to one another, listening to both sides, and truly listening, not just when you're hearing someone talk for you, figuring out what you're gonna say next, yeah. but just clearing your mind and listening to what they have to say. Um, and so we're hopefully building a better future okay. in which we can have civil discourse with one another because right now what we're seeing, and I feel like the model the role models that we have um, aren't doing that. I agree. All right, Stacy, that brings us to a question from John that we got uh, from Facebook. John wanted to know, you all are voting different ways, perhaps. You're all in different places in Minnesota. You all live different lives. How would you, or how will you, work after today to have those conversations in that way? How will you, quote unquote, reach across the aisle? Kevin? Thank you. Um, I tell the truth. I'm sober now, I've been five and a half years. And one of the things I learned is if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. <laughs> one of the problems with that is people get offended. Okay. And that's in this interpersonal conversation that we're having with people in different walks of life. We're all speaking with each other. Social media is abhorrent because you can get bullied. And when I write social media, I make sure that I have my commas correctly. I make sure everything's in place because if you have a comma in the wrong place, Someone doesn't stop where you think you stopped and they're looking at a text that you hate them instead of you like them, which is one of the problems with today's youth. They don't have interpersonal relationships. Uh, I would love to sit down and talk with everybody all night long. I know I'm going to disagree with probably 75% of the people that are blue, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to listen to them because I would love somebody on the left right now to be able to stand up and give me an option that I could listen to because resistance is not an option. It's resistance. And too much resistance causes overload. Overload causes fire. And so we don't need that. Interpersonal relationships with everyone, regardless of what you believe, and, and I'll use my son's quote, doesn't matter who you sleep with, what you do, where you work for, just don't be a Richard. He doesn't even swear. <laughs> Margaret, I want to ask you about that. You mentioned, you know, you have a long history with the Republican Party. And will you be willing to reach across the aisle to Nancy tomorrow, even though I don't think either one of you are going to Congress? If so, you had a great ride in campaign. <laughs> right, right. I, I don't think I really want to do that. But yes, I feel I can always reach across that. All said and done, the people have spoke and we'll have to make make do with what we have. I mean, and maybe make do is not the right word. We'll have to accept, accept make do's okay. Ex accept it yeah. and, and see how we can come together and how we can make a better world for everybody. I think that, I mean, I think we all agree here. We want a better world for our children, grandchildren and, and how we get there. Maybe it won't be the course that I thought we should take, but we'll maybe take another course, but hopefully we can still get there. I mean, I will always, you know, I, 
have, I one time was sitting at a Republican table and a news reporter came up to me and said, well, what would you do if you had a Democrat friend? I said, well, I talk to him just like everybody else. You know, I mean, uh, we need to, and, and I, you know, I'm a lifelong Republican, but that doesn't mean that I can't have a conversation with Democrats and, and we all have to work together. After this is all over with, we're gonna get out there and, and, and work together to make this a better world. However we get there, we'll do it. You know, I mean, I have my ideas on how, what I think about immigration and about the economy and everything like that, but I might have to change my ideas a little bit and figure out a different path to take. But And that's been the history of the party system. There are different ideas about what it makes America work, and we just have kind of lost our way with one another. Right, I remember one time I, was not a Jesse Ventura fan and he was elected and I remember walking into work the next day and saying, well, it's gonna be okay, Margaret, it's always okay. You know, I mean, I, at first I didn't think, I thought, oh, the world's gonna end, but it's not gonna end. We are gonna go forward and, and we'll, we'll get there. And, you know, I mean, it, like I say, it might be a different path, but we'll get there and we'll, we'll, we'll do it together. Some of my best friends are Democrats. <laughs> Nancy, you agree with any of this? Be nice, Nancy. <laughs> I love it. I hope that's my slogan going forward. It is. You have heart yeah. socks and yeah. be nice on I'm, your shirt. I'm, it's all over me. Yeah. Um, I live with a Republican, and I can say that um, we have great conversations. Um, we learn from each other. He um, helps me understand where he's coming from, and uh, we do the same. Both of us do the same. I have both uh, Democratic and Republican children that are very opinionated, um, and I do lots of listening, <laughs> lots. <laughs> and I have um, a huge base in Shakopee of Republican and Democratic friends, both from my neighborhood and the schools that I've worked in and volunteered in, and um, we, just, we just work to get along. I like it. I like that. All right, we're going to move on uh, to some more questions the next time we come back. We're getting all of your questions on Facebook Live, so thanks so much for sending those in. We'll get to those, some of those issues, but keep them coming. We're going to send it back to Chris. Thanks so much, Jana. Appreciate it. The panel is just awesome, man. I wish people would really chime in here so they can hear what this panel is all about. Now, we have some results coming in already. So this is great. The polls closed a little while ago. We finally have some precincts reporting Granted, it's not the majority of precincts, but there are some numbers to give you right now. According to the Secretary of State, the uh, Housley-Smith race, we have Smith ahead uh, uh, 56 to 40 right now with, uh, I'm not sure how many pre precincts are reporting in that one right now, but for the governor's race, Tim Walls versus Jeff Johnson. Walls is ahead 56% to 41%, so an early lead for uh, Congressman Tim Walls. Uh, Lewis over Craig so far, 56 to 43, so quite a, uh, a lead right there for Lewis. Uh, and let's see, in the Attorney General's race, we have Ellison ahead, 51 to 43 right now, so an early, uh, early lead for uh, Keith Ellison. All right, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to turn it back over to Randy Shaver, Julie Nelson, and our panel. We'll see you back here after they're done. Uh, and we'll continue our Facebook Live. You can catch us on Facebook, care11.com, YouTube, and Twitter. Four of them. It's all you. It's all you can. It's all you need for local coverage tonight. So thanks for sticking with us.
Welcome back to Kara Levin's coverage of the midterm elections. Results are just starting to roll in. The polls closed 26 minutes ago. And tonight, no surprise, NBC News is projecting Democratic Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar has won her race and kept her seat. Her challenger was Minnesota State Representative Jim Newberger. Senator Klobuchar has held that seat since 2006. We are still waiting on the results, however, of the special Senate race tonight. Democratic Senator Tina Smith and her challenger, Republican Minnesota State Senator Karen Housley. And here's a live look now at the DFL election night party in St. Paul. We are waiting to hear from Senator Klobuchar. And when we do, uh, when she does show up there at the on stage, we will go right to it if it happens during this time period that we're live right now. We are joined once again by Brian McClung and Catherine Tanucci to talk about specifically in the next few minutes uh, the other Senate race in Minnesota. It was widely anticipated that Senator Klobuchar would win re-election. Uh, but this race, Tina Smith and Karen Housley, Brian, uh, we were talking in the break, that it just started to kind of get onto the national radar in the last couple weeks, maybe, as possibly more competitive yeah. than originally thought. And I think that's the race that Senator Housley wanted to run. I think she was concerned that if she got too much traction early, then the national groups would come in and try to stop her and that the uh, Democrat Senatorial Committee would spend a lot of money. And in fact, we did see that at the end, that the Democrat Senatorial Committee and some of their allies spent about a million dollars in that race, which was unanticipated. So that race really did move into the top 10 at the end. I think that's what the Housley campaign wanted to do. They wanted to peak at the right moment at the end of the race. I think she's run a good race a close race and she has been very feisty, very competitive and we'll see that as the results start to come in, we'll see how that one turns out. I think right now we're looking at, at least we can see a screen here where Tina Smith early, 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 60%, Karen Housley, 37 Catherine, follow up on what he said yeah, about that's, this race. That's, those are very early results. T when Tina got appointed to this seat about 10 months ago, um, she had to, she had a really steep learning curve to both overnight become a United States Senator, um, not something that she was planning on doing, but she got right to work for Minnesotans. At the very same time, she had to start her campaign. And 10 months is not a lot of time for a U.S. Senate campaign. Usually when you run for Senate, you've got years to think about it, right. raise the money, plan for it. And so um, it's a very unusual race um, for, for both, for both Tina Smith, who, who was running to be elected to the seat she was appointed to, and for her challenger, um, who had the same challenge of needing to launch a campaign in a short amount of time. I think... Tina's done a tremendous job for Minnesotans in, in terms of getting right to work and, and authoring legislation that's been signed by the president, bipartisan legislation. She's been a great leader for Minnesotans, and, and we'll see how that plays out for her well, tonight. And let's not forget that this is only for two years. So this is only to fill out the end of what had His been term. Senator Franken's term, term in office. And it'll be up on the ballot again in two years. So it's almost like a congressional race mm -hmm. for U.S. Senate. That's a lot to ask. And I guess I wouldn't be surprised, regardless of the outcome, if we don't see Tina Smith and Karen Housley running again. Mm -hmm. Because when you've invested this much time and raised the money and built the networks, then to you know, not do it again, yeah. um, it's kind of unfathomable. So that is really a lot, though, to have back-to-back -back U.S. Senate races like that. Thank you very much, guys. We've got to send it back to NBC. And we will see you in about a half an hour. Our conversation continues online. Head to CARE 11 on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube right now for our Decision 2018 live coverage. Hey everybody, welcome back. We're uh, continuing our stream on Facebook Live. We're on YouTube, the Care Levin's YouTube page. We're on the uh, Care Levin's Twitter page. We're on carelevin.com. So we're hoping to bring you more local coverage as you want it. You can stream us on your phone. You can stream us on your computer while you're watching NBC and the, uh, the national races. Let's get some more results right now. We're going to go straight to the Secretary of State's uh, website here where all the results are just coming in. So in the governor's race, we have 4.4%. Uh, of precincts reporting around the state right now. That's 181 out of about 4,000. And what we have right now is a pretty big lead 
for Congressman Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan. 64.5% is their lead right now. Uh, they have a pretty big lead over Jeff Johnson and Donna Bergstrom. Let's go to some of the U.S. Senate races. If we could just see how many uh, people are reporting in these races right now. Uh, it looks still like 4.4% here. Stand by. Well, Klobuchar was called, okay, with a 70% lead. My goodness. You guys are looking live again at the Secretary of State's page right now. So in the race between... Uh, uh, Senator Tina Smith and Karen Housley. Smith starts with another overwhelming lead, almost similar to the to the Walls race. She has 64% right now, and Karen Housley has 32% of the votes that are in. Again, 4.4% of the precincts in this state reporting. Not that far in yet. We got a long ways to go here. And what we want to do, okay, is Lou ready right now, Nick? We can toss over to him. All right, so we're going to go to Lou Raguse right now, who is at Angie Craig's camp, who is actually not at the DFL headquarters, right, Lou? How are things going there right now? Right, Chris, we're in Egan. That's where Angie Craig is holding her party right now. It's a full house at this bar right now. This is one of those critical seats that the Democrats need to flip in order to take control of the House. And they think they have a good shot here. This is a rematch of the 2016 matchup between Angie Craig and uh, Jason Lewis in Congressional District 2. Only 6,000 votes separated these two two years ago. Right now, as you mentioned, Angie Craig has jumped out to an early lead. It's important to note, though, that the votes that have been counted so far come from Dakota County. Dakota County is where Angie Craig has a lot of support. She won Dakota County by 6,000 votes two years ago. Uh, if you're keeping score at home, I would keep track of Dakota County if Angie Craig can increase her lead there more so than she did two years ago. The other county to keep an eye on is Scott County. In Scott County, Jason Lewis won by 12,000 votes last time around. If Angie Craig can narrow that margin or even win Scott County, she has an excellent shot at taking this seat. Uh, Chris, this is a, a, a race, a, a rematch here, as I mentioned. Last time around, though, there was a third party candidate that took nearly 29,000 votes. That's something that Angie Craig has mentioned that uh, played a role last time around without that third party candidate taking 29,000 votes. Uh, anything can happen here tonight, Chris. Yeah, Lou, quick question for you and an update. Uh, we have Jason Lewis up by three points right now, 51 percent to Angie Craig's 48 percent, only two percent of the precincts reporting. So still super young right now in the night, but we have Jason Lewis with a slight lead. Uh, you said it was less than two percentage points, the victory declared by Lewis uh, two years ago. What's the, what's the mood in the room right now, and do they think that this, you know, quote-unquote supposed blue wave is going to bring Craig uh, to victory this time? Well, I think the main thing that different that uh, Angie Craig thinks is different is the state of the country and the state of her congressional district. Uh, she's, you know, the, 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 she was considered to be a favorite last time around. It oh, was wow. actually surprising to many people that Jason Lewis beat Angie Craig two years ago, and uh, it, it was part of that... President Donald Trump wave that surprised a lot of people. He won Congressional District 2 by about 4,000 votes. And so that was maybe a little bit of a surprise. And then uh, Jason Lewis uh, beating her by 6,000 votes was a little bit of a surprise. I think Angie Craig is really banking on the fact that a lot has changed in two years. There's uh, hopefully, she's hoping that there's a larger uh, voter turnout this time around that would weigh in her favor. And she said that in interviews. She said that she's seen more voters in places that she hasn't. She, had, she didn't see them last time around. Also, her image this time around. A lot of the political ads have been featuring this race, and you see Angie Craig out there a lot, uh, kind of touting her biography. Um, yeah. She's a businesswoman from Egan, talking about her family a lot more, trying to appeal to farmers and people in rural areas more than last time around. And so it, the, the race has a little bit of a different feel. And um, I can tell you right now, this room right now is a room of confidence. I think okay. that they would be surprised if the results start to shift toward Jason Lewis's way. But this is expected to be a very close race. And I'm watching the results come in uh, as we speak here. And most of them are coming from Dakota County early on. Yeah. As I mentioned, Dakota County is where most of her support is from. And right. so don't, don't, don't think that she's too big of a lead right now because there's a lot of votes to be counted. Good deal.
Lou Bruce, thank you so much over at Angie Craig's uh, headquarters tonight. Appreciate it. Angie Craig, like you said, uh, lives in Egan with her wife and four sons. Uh, she's touting about being raised by uh, her mother. So she's raised by a single mother uh, in a mobile home park. It's right on her website to talk about this. And uh, she was an executive at St. Jude Medical. We're going to stick with the 2nd District and we're going to get to Adrian Broaddus in one second because we have to report that the Associated Press right now, wow, is calling the race for State Representative Ilhan Omar. Well, I think most people saw that coming, especially in that district, right? That Keith Ellison left. So, okay. Well, the Associated Press is calling that race and um, if she's going to speak soon, maybe we'll pop over to her and see what she has to say. So look at that. We have, uh, well, there it is. Okay, so we got 76% over uh, 24 for Jennifer Zielinski. All right, well, the Associated Press calling that race in the 5th District for Minnesota. Outstanding. Um, so what we want to do is go over to Adrian Broaddus right now, though. So she's at the GOP headquarters, and we want to stick with the Congressional 2nd District and talk about Angie Craig's competitor, the incumbent, Jason Lewis, second year in Congress, longtime radio show host in the Twin Cities. How's the feeling going over there? Slight lead for Lewis, but uh, what's the atmosphere like right now, Adrian? Uh, right now, Chris, I can tell you it's optimistic, jovial. People have their beverages in hand, and they're saying they're hopeful about what will happen here tonight. You know, you've called some of the other races, but the eyes of this crowd are still on District 2. And for many here, it feels a lot like deja vu as Jason Lewis is looking to beat Angie Craig once again. Here's the deal. We know this is a competitive race. I'm going to pause right now and just take a look over my shoulder. I see or I hear a lot of cheering. A lot of folks in the crowd here at GOP headquarters are keeping their eyes on the big monitor. So they are uh, monitoring the results as they come in. But getting back to this race, it's a really competitive race. District 2 makes up most of the South Metro. And if you think about it, you have a progressive and a Trump-backed conservative in this race. The thing is, Angie Craig and Jason Lewis have a lot in common. But the flip side to that is the problems that they see with America moving forward, they don't really agree when it comes to how to when it comes to solving those problems or the way to fix those problems. For example, let's break down uh, immigration and border security. They both want better border security. By contrast, Lewis wants to build a wall. I'm going to pause again right now, Chris. So you can see that results are coming up. It looks like Pete Stauber is leaving, leading right now. And there are a few uh, applauses as different candidates come up. We've heard a lot of boos throughout the night. Whenever uh, Congressman Ellison would show up on the screen, there would be boos. When the race was called for Senator Klobuchar, there were also boos. So that kind of paints the picture. It gives you a little bit of the mood as to what is going on here. But as far as Lewis is concerned, we will see what happens. The big question is, what will voters say? And they are going to make their case. They've, uh, the polls, as we all know, are already closed. But he's heavily depending on Scott County, which he won previously. Yeah. Chris? Thank you so much, Adrian. We'll check back in with you guys in a little bit here. We appreciate it. Uh, it looks like Lewis still has a, a lead over Craig at this point. But we want to switch uh, pictures over to the U.S. House District 1. So this is the district that Tim Walls left, right? So he was a congressman there for uh, a number of terms. He left to run for governor. And the two candidates we have there are Dan Fian. He's a Democrat, born and raised in southern Minnesota, served two tours in Iraq, served our nation. He was a teacher and also worked in the Pentagon. And in the Republican side, you have Jim Hagedorn. So he was a business manager from uh, Blue Earth down there in the, in, in the southern Minnesota. And he's been a congressional staffer uh, for a while. I worked at the Treasury Department as an employee for a while. Let's take a look at the results of how that race is doing in District 1. So you only have 3% of the precincts reporting, but you got a smoke and lead for Jim Hagedorn right now, the Republican. He's up 62 to 37 over Dan Fian. Let's check in with Danny Spiewak, though, who's down in Mankato right now at the heart of that district, which stretches from you know, west of there all the way to Rochester and, and further to the east. Danny, what are you seeing right now? To, to well, Chris, we have Dan Fian, who has just taken the podium, and I want to show you as he starts his opening remarks here for the first time tonight as he started to watch election results come in. I could not be more honored to have you here uh, tonight, uh, to see friends 
uh, old and new along the way. Those who have traveled far to be here and those who didn't have to travel so far as well. Um, it, it's an honor. Amy and I have spent the last five days traveling about 1,500 miles all around the district and seeing just incredible groups of people just like this, so fired up uh, for the future of Southern Minnesota and the future of this country. Yes. Uh, I'm so honored to have you here So Chris, this is the first time that we're hearing from Dan Fee, and right now as he uh, is addressing the crowd here in Mankato, uh, this is one of the closest watched races in the country in terms of House seats, Chris, because this is an obviously, as you mentioned, a democratically controlled seat by Tim Wallace for the last six terms, and now this is a chance for the Republicans eager uh, to steal this seat for the GOP. Uh, but Dan Fian has uh, done two tours in Iraq. Uh, he is uh, someone who's worked in the Pentagon and the Obama administration, and he's tried to present himself as someone that will stand up to the president as somebody uh, who will be a check on the president from Congress. Uh, a newcomer, though, and that's why Jim Hagen on the GOP side, who's having his watch party uh, just a couple of blocks away, uh, feels a little bit confident about this as well. He's gone yeah. up against Tim Wallace the last uh, two years. This is his fourth try. Um, he lost by less than one percentage point um, against Wallace in 2016. So they say they're optimistic now that they're facing a newcomer and not an incumbent. So Chris, uh, this is a very closely watched race across the country. Um, it's something we'll be watching closely as well here in Maine. Right, yeah. So it's interesting, Danny. I want to ask you a question if you can hear me. This is a, a, a congressional district that was held by Congressman Walls, a Democrat, for a long time. But as you saw when, when President Trump went and campaigned down there in Rochester, there was a ton of support for that president. And I'm wondering, as close as this race is, is it a referendum on the president? Is that what you're hearing from people down there? Yeah, Chris, I think the president looms large over this race in particular. And, and the thing is, is that I think Dan Fian has tried to paint himself as somebody that can stand up for, you know, what is in many places a rural district in southern Minnesota. I mean, he's said that he'll stand up to the president, but will work with him if needed. But he's been very vocal in opposing the president's tariffs and his trade policy. Um, and in terms of Jim Hagedorn, he's really aligned himself with the president on so many issues. He's really presented himself as an ally of the president. And he said that Dan Fian is somebody that will, uh, you know, take the country away from those policies. So, yeah, I think in a lot of ways it's fair to say that, like many races across the country, that this probably is a referendum on President Trump and is expected to be an extremely close race here. Um, you know, last year we were told uh, when Walls and Hagedorn went against each other in 2016, I should say 2016, the last term, yeah. uh, last election cycle, uh, it was 2 a.m. before they actually knew the results. And that was a 0.7 percent margin. Wow. So I think we're going to expect something similar here in Mankato tonight. Well, thank you, Danny. Great coverage. Uh, good to see you down in Mankato. We'll check back in with you later and uh, maybe during one of these cut-ins with the anchors where you can see you at 10 o'clock because that's going to be a close race. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go over to Janice Shorto with our voter panel. Bad timing. You know, my chair just started spinning around, but I'm here now. <laughs> we just wrapped up a very heated discussion about the greatest show of all time on television, The West Wing. We're done. For and sure. now we can talk about other things like the state of our state and the state of our nation. I know I'm getting a little punchy. I'm getting a little punchy, you guys. Results are coming in. I've only had one Mountain Dew in the last two hours. <laughs> I have a question that's coming from one of our viewers on Facebook, Matt Bickett. Now, this is going to be like a rapid fire round, OK? So each person will get about 20 seconds to answer this question. What is the hot button issue that really gets you this year? John? Uh, 20 seconds. Let's see. I think people need to be more informed before they cast their vote. You know, and that's kind of a different issue than, let's say, health care, immigration, or education, which I haven't even heard a lot about, is that you need to know the candidates on the ballot and what you stand for uh, before you cast that vote. If I don't know someone on the ballot, even if they have an R next to their name, I don't vote for them. I make sure I do my homework. The that's judges it. on the back, you know, I don't have the time. You know, one of those people does deserve my vote, but at the same time, I'm not educated to make that decision. And when you see a D or an R next to the name of someone that is supposed to indicate that that's someone who shares your views, and that it's a likely, it's a good bet that voting for them, um, they'll align with you. But at the same time, you just need to make sure uh, you really read up, not just on the candidates, but on, on all of it, on history, on, on the news. And uh, make sure when you go into, the, go into the booth that you can make the best use of your constitutional right to vote. That's pretty cool that John points that out. If you haven't been with us this whole time, John, you're with the Young Republicans, right? Yeah, college And you're not just going straight R. 
You're informing. Well, uh, no, I'm talking about the, the judges on the back. John is changing the answer to his question. <laughs> I'm saying if I if I don't know someone, I did because I did do John my homework. Because that, yeah. that is <laughs> that is right. That is my job um, to know everyone. So yeah. I do. Okay. Um, but in past I haven't, especially okay. in local elections, sure. uh, like when I voted in 2017. A lot of names I wasn't familiar with, um, just because. It takes a lot of time, That's you know, true. and local politics is just as, as important, if not more so, for our lives. Absolutely. And we like to, you know, Trump eclipses all, but in reality, you know, it matters a lot more who, uh, who's in your neighborhood making the calls. True. Margaret, was there one issue that really drove you this year, or? Um, I don't know. He took more than 20 seconds, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I. Minnesota nice is done. <laughs> right. No, um, I, I totally agree with him as far as voting in, in your local elections are very important. But I guess the hot button issues for me have been the economy and health care. I worked in health care for 50 some years, so I've always been in tune to health care. And I think it's very important, but also the economy is, too. And a lot of it's driven by each other, too. True. So, um, so I guess those are my hot button issues. All right, Nancy, with all the friends on Facebook. Nancy was saying hi out there. I, I'm seeing all the comments come in on Facebook, and I know half of you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great. Jug or not? It's great to have great to have friends out there. Um, I'd say my hot button issues. Two of them would be um, the economy and where that's headed. And um, I have have we have a great stake in Shakopee uh, for the school board, and I wanted to make sure my voice was heard today and across the across the board. I literally thought you were just endorsing great steak in Shakopee. <laughs> That's what I thought she said. I was like, we oh, well, how about a pro tip here, Nancy? Where can we get the great steak in Shakopee? But she was talking about education, which is no laughing matter. I digress. Renita, what's driving you this year? Oh, my gosh. Um, what drove me this year, um, and it's going to be three things. It was education, number one. Um, I'm a mom, and I volunteer with the Finance Advisory Committee in my district in 191. And what ha has given me the opportunity to really understand financing and, and the challenges that our schools are facing. And so for me, education has been front and center to really drive home with those who are running for office and our elected officials to really talk about how they can really do more to support our schools and funding um, and the other two are so close are very very closely related and it's about more women in politics that has been number one well close but close with education for me but women in um, politics and especially diversity so diversity and women in politics especially to women of color so that has been a big driving force for me around how can we see more of that and I think this year this midterm election has really demonstrated that folks need more of that and I say that's that's what drives me. Cool, Stacy, what's doing it for you? Um, well, as a teacher, education is obviously near and dear to my heart. Um, I I feel like our schools need more funding um, in order for our schools. Are, they're supposed to be the great equalizer, right? And we can't do that good work without um, enough funding. So that's you know first and foremost. And then I care really strongly about um, healthcare and women's rights when, um, when it comes to healthcare as well. So, and I'm the mother of three girls. And so that's something that I think about often as well and their future, so. Kevin, what drives you to politics? Uh, this might not be a popular answer, but the America First Agenda. I am a veteran. I am probably uniquely qualified on this board to talk about it. I spent six and a half years in a wall behind West Berlin and walls work. Walls work. They have doors in them. You go through the door, no problem. As a veteran, as a disabled veteran, there are thousands, millions of disabled and PTSD suffering veterans in America right now that are not being helped. I'm all for helping people that need help, but you got to help your own first. When I see a veteran on the ground and people walk past them, it just, I, I get physically sick. Veterans are why you people are here on this board. Veterans are why schools work. Veterans are why the press works. Veterans is why we are able to do everything we do because we put our, ourselves on the line for you. I signed a blank check. It's open for good. I took an oath. It never expires. Do we deserve to help everybody in the world? Yes, because we're the greatest, mm -hmm. most beneficial nation in the country. However, it starts at home. And if you fix your home, everything outside gets better. So America first is why I'm here. 
All right, we got a few minutes left on this this last round of questions, and we got another one from Facebook that I think is pretty interesting, from of course Nancy's friend Jeannie, and Nancy's a plant here. You ever see plants at press conferences? They always have all the good questions, Nancy. So this one is an interesting one. I hear a lot as a member of the media, and we'll have one person from each side. Not that you guys are on sides, but you literally are on sides. Answer this one. We hear a lot about what's going on in the metro. What's going on in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the seven ca counties surrounding them. But how do we unite the metro area without state Minnesota? How do we really, 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 really become one Minnesota? I've been in greater Minnesota all summer long. Uh, you say greater Minnesota. They don't like they don't like outer Minnesota yeah. there. I found out my the hard way. You and know up what, in Kevin? Baud, up in Baudette and Thief River Falls, it's the northwest corner of Minnesota. Kevin, I'm for one Minnesota. I call them all sorts of loving names. But the thing is, out there, the people are concerned about income. They're concerned about what they can do to make their next day better and what they can do to help their community become better. They're not worried about Minneapolis. Minneapolis to outstate Minnesota is Minneapolis, I'm sorry, greater Minnesota, is another state. Mm -hmm. we, I spent with a campaign three and a half months in greater Minnesota. It didn't matter black, white, green, yellow, purple, Democrat or Republican. People said please. People said thank you. People were mi mild and held the door for you. In Minneapolis, you look at somebody that's on the wrong side, they're going to spit at you. They're going to, and again, I'm speaking metaphorically. It's, it's greater Minnesota and the downtown metro area are two completely different places. And I think that has a lot to do with the speed of what's going on in greater Minnesota versus what's happening in the Twin City area. All right, we've got about 50 seconds left. Margaret, how do we become one Minnesota? What's the solution? I think if I had that answer, we, I would be rich. But <laughs> I'm not. It's true. We'd be voting for you as <laughs> a writing voting candidate. voting for me, right, right. But you're not, and I don't want to. But I, I think it's, they're very different people. So I don't think you can re uh, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago and down south of Illinois are different. Yeah. I mean, you have your farmers, and they live a different life than the people in the cities do. I've lived on both sides of them. And I don't think we can ever... I mean, I don't know that we need to. I mean, it's... Exactly. It Maybe would respect be, our differences, right? Right, we need to respect our differences. I mean, the, the farmer chose not to live in the city. He did not want to live in the city. The city person, I live in the country, I like it, and I grew up in the city, and I don't want to live in downtown Minneapolis, and we need to respect the differences and, and get along. I mean, we need to respect our differences and understand there are going to be differences and just try to be civil and not have a wall between us. Well, that's it. Woo, bring it back. And that's going to conclude this part of the panel, which is we need to respect each other's differences, no matter where we live in Minnesota, and work together. So awesome answer, Margaret. We'll send it back to you, Chris. Thanks, Jana. We have some news here. Uh, we know that Ilhan Omar has won the 5th District. That was called by the Associated Press. It now appears, according to NBC, that Dean Phillips, the Democrat, a Dina native, has won the uh, third congressional district over incumbent Republican Eric Paulson. That is according to NBC. And uh, on the Associated Press website, we are seeing a 13-point margin right now for Dean Phillips with 33% reporting. So that's the latest news we have right now. We're going to toss it back to our uh, panel. And Randy and Julie, we'll see you back here in a few minutes.
Welcome back to our live election coverage at CARE 11. The polls have been closed for about an hour, so we're starting to see some results come in, and we've got a few uh, races that NBC has called tonight. We're starting with the race in the third district. Dean Phillips uh, has been projected to win. He was running against Eric Paulson, the Republican incumbent in that district. In the uh, Senate race, the special uh, Senate race between Tina Smith and Karen Housley, and we don't see any results there as yet. Unfortunately, a blank screen. We'll get back to that when we can. Tammy, there we go. Tina Smith at 60%. Again, this is very early on. In fact, I think this is less than 20% reporting. Uh, Tammy Baldwin over in western Wisconsin has been named by NBC as the winner in her race. And then we have District 5 back here in Minnesota. Ilhan Omar has won Minnesota's 5th district in the House. That one uh, not as surprising, perhaps, as some of the other races that we just mentioned, but uh, a Democratic winner in the 5th district once again. Uh, we are joined once again by our analysts, Catherine Tanucci and Brian McClung. And uh, let's start off with what about that list? Anything that surprises you or stands out? Brian, go ahead. Well, I think the question is, is this going to be a blue wave? Is it something that washes over everything or is it more of a tornado? You're talking is about here in Minnesota. Yeah, here in Minnesota. Is it something that is more specific and where there are areas of volatility, where there are things that are churned up? And I think we recognize that the third congressional district in the western suburbs was an area where there was a lot of volatility, where there were a lot of voters who potentially were unhappy with President Trump and looked at this election as an opportunity to take out some of that anger. So the question becomes, is that statewide? Is that widespread? Or is that just in pockets? And we really don't have enough results from, say, the first congressional district mm -hmm. or the second congressional district to get a feel for that quite yet. That's an important thing to point out. First and second district right now, they're 2% of their precincts reporting right. there. Catherine, how does that affect the larger picture? Right. It's something we're just going to have to keep waiting and hitting refresh on the website and, <laughs> and tuning in to, to CARE 11 to see the results because it will take some time for those. It's often precincts and counties in greater Minnesota, which tend to be a little more red on the map, um, are often a little bit slower to report. And so we'll have to just keep waiting to see those results. I mean, it, seeing the results in the Phillips-Paulson race is is something we were watching closely. I, I was hopeful that the DFLer would win. Um, it was not a done deal mm -hmm. though. And so it was, it's in, encouraging to Democrats right now to see those results coming in so strong for Dean Phillips. And obviously District 2 is one that's gonna be interesting to watch between Angie Craig and Jason Lewis. And we haven't seen yet the updated numbers on that yet, but that one's gonna be one to watch here too. Yeah, the demographics are a little bit different yep. in District 2. I live in the second congressional district. Um, it's maybe a little bit more blue collar. It has some more rural areas in it. So it's a little different than the Western suburbs. Um, that congressional district that Eric Paulson represented where Dean Phillips has been called the winner, that was more akin to one we talked about earlier where Barbara Comstock had held the seat in yep. the suburbs of Washington, D.C. So it's a little bit different in the second. We'll see again, is it a wave or are these kind of pockets of unrest? Let's talk about that particular pocket where Dean Phillips has been declared a winner. Lindsay Siebert is live from Democratic headquarters now where they are celebrating that win tonight. Lindsay? Hi, Julie. Yes, Ed. A little bit of trouble hearing you over this crowd because of the absolute elation in this moment. Uh, this is state history with NBC just calling uh, Phillips as the winner with a 56%, capturing 56% of the votes in his district compared to 43% of Paulson, so a 13-point margin. And state history because a Republican GOP representative has held the congressional seat in this district since 1961. I just want you to see the elation in the crowd here. He has had, he's had a loyal base of followers uh, with a campaign slogan called Everyone's Invited. The Star Tribune and Voice, uh, pardon me here, the Star Tribune endorsed Phillips because what they say that he has an inclusive and independent voice over Paulson, who hadn't, ha Paulson had not held a town hall with his district for about seven years. So again, absolute excitement. We are not sure when Phillips is set to arrive, uh, but we are waiting. I don't know that this room could get any more packed. When we first started, it was kind of sleepy. And again, Phillips excited days. These are a lot of volunteers I've been talking to that have worked tire tirelessly with him, that have known him for years. They are just so excited in this uh, historic moment here, guys.
All right, we're going to see if we get back hooked up with Lindsay Sievert there because I want to take the temperature of that room as the Associated Press and NBC News are calling Dean Phillips, the Democrat, in District 3 as the winner over an uh, incumbent Republican, Eric Paulson. Dean Phillips is an interesting story. So he's an Adina native, graduated from Brown University and got his MBA at the University of Minnesota Carlson School of Management, worked his way up his father's liquor business, eventually becoming CEO of that company. And now we have, what do we have? 87% of the precincts reporting, so you gotta call it for Dean Phillips. Wow, what a result. That's like a, it's kind of a surprising race right there to be called this early. So, uh, okay, as soon as we get Lindsay fired back up, we're gonna pop back over to Dean Phillips. We're also gonna pop back over just, to- Okay, uh, I hear him, okay, hold on. Oh, okay, it sounds like I got Lindsay going right now. Hey, Lindsay, can you hear me? Uh, I can now. I'm sorry. I was having trouble with my earpiece communicating with you the, guys, but I, I think I'm back. Yeah, Lindsay, you never have to apologize to me. As the nicest person in the world, you don't have to apologize to anybody. Is that oh, a little God. too much? Too much. No, we're good. All right, Lindsay, so what's going on there? They just called it for Phillips. Um, sounds like there was a lot of celebration before you took yeah. the earpiece out. Is he about to speak there? Are they, are they planning yeah. the celebrations now? I'm not sure. I, I don't know where he is. I, I, I do believe that from what I've heard that he is set to arrive. And I keep hearing these cheers and I don't know if he's walking in. Um, but the moment that NBC called it, uh, people just erupted in cheers for Dean. And again, um, you know, a Republican has held this congressional seat since... So really just a historic moment, um, a really loyal base of his supporters, many of them volunteers uh, who have been with him since the very beginning. Uh, as a man with, you know, a wealthy businessman, a philanthropist who has deep roots in this community in so many facets, he really has collected just and amassed uh, so many followers here, guys. So it's really neat to see the excitement on their faces during this historic moment. Yeah, it was super interesting reading up on, uh, reading up on his story and how his father was in the service and he died and left his mother widowed and then his mother remarried into the Phillips family, which started the distillation or distilling company, Phillips Vodka, and among, among uh, other products that they produce, and, and he found all this money. So it's a really interesting story, and he's worked his way up uh, that yeah. business to get to where he is today, and clearly people are following him now. Yeah, it, I, I read that he was six months old when his father was killed in action, uh, you know, a gold star son, and his mom happened to meet this wealthy, well, I don't even know if he was wealthy at the time, but met Mr. Phillips, you know, the heir to the distillery, um, the many, many businesses. Um, so he grew up, you know, with wealth, but what I read is that he never took it for granted and he always felt like he wanted to pay it forward to the gifts that had been given to him. He really felt like it was important with his value system to give to others. Yeah. Um, I didn't know he was behind, uh, you know, a huge gelato company, uh, Petty's Coffee here in South Minneapolis. So, so a multifaceted man, a philanthropist, I actually saw him in, in uh, Penny's Coffee a few months ago. He was holding a meeting and he was clearing people's dishes and plates from tables while holding yeah. this meeting. And I hey. realized, who's this man clearing my dishes? It was Phillips. Lindsay, so sorry to cut you off right now. Yeah, I ahead. really appreciate you chiming in here. we got to hop over to Eric Carlson. Carla Holtz over there right now. We want to hop into his concession speech. the initiatives speak. that I have authored, it's literally saving lives. I also want to say, the protecting, protecting Minnesota jobs and medical innovation by eliminating the medical device taps is, tax has been one of my top priorities, of course. Because that's all about preserving and protecting one of Minnesota's and America's greatest success stories. But I also want to really mention, finally, that passing once-in-a-generation tax reform to make our economy boom again with confidence is really critical. This is giving every single Minnesotan, especially the next generation, the opportunity to have a more prosperous future. Nothing could be better than thinking of the future for the next generation. And finally, I will just say that none of these efforts, none of those efforts were about politics or party. They're simply about doing what is right for Minnesota. We're blessed to live in a really great state, in a really great country. It's been an honor to represent you in Congress, and I am so appreciative of your support and friendship here tonight. God bless all of you. God bless Minnesota, and may God continue to bless the United States of America.
Thank you very much. So there you have it. That's uh, well, former Congressman Eric Paulson, the incumbent Republican who was um, who was making his concession speech, and now we see Carla Halt, obviously, who has uh, been there monitoring this. Carla, what was the reaction when they just found out that Paulson had lost this race? Because I don't think the polls were as much of a lead for Phillips as it ended up turning into, right? Right, absolutely. This was expected to be down to the wire, just a real nail biter. So no one was expecting this race to get called as early as it did. I think uh, la not least of whom would have been Representative Eric Paulson himself. A lot of optimism at the start of this night, believing that that high voter turnout would work in the favor of Republicans. Obviously, this race that did not turn out to be the case. He just did say that it was the greatest honor of his life to be serving in his district and that he did wish Dean Phillips the best as he takes over this and uh, wishes him the best as he goes forward. Obviously, again, too, Chris, this was an extremely expensive race on both sides with just hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent, uh, millions of dollars actually being spent in this race, hoping to pull out a win. And Republicans yeah. didn't get that here tonight. Yeah, we saw so much money spent in this race, as you just said, yeah. uh, both from the PACs and the candidates. Paulson, yeah. I mean, he was in the third district for 10 years. And then he was in the state representative and a House majority leader from 2003 to 2007. He worked at Target Corporation as a business analyst. I mean, this is a man who spent a lot of years in politics. So there must be pretty vast disappointment right now there. It, it was. And you know, what was interesting about this race too, Chris, is that in terms of the president, he did not closely align himself with the president. You'll note that he did not attend the rally in Rochester. He was not present for the rally in Duluth. He tried to build a little bit of a divide there. The president did endorse him, did support him for this contest. But in terms of the representative himself, he tried to allow for a little bit of space there as he was approaching this race, recognizing that his district was leaning a little bit more toward the middle than his party was steering with uh, President Trump. Carla Holt, live at the GOP headquarters where they uh, just found out Dean Phillips has won that race versus uh, incumbent Eric Paulson. Thank you so much, Carla. All right, we continue the stream. We're going to go back over to Jana Shortle, who's with our voter panel. Jana. Hey, Chris. Well, my voter panel, we all took a break to look at those results and probably shock on the outside of this panel. They didn't know that was going to happen either, or at least be called this early. But Carla talked about something. You mentioned it, and it was about the cost of that race. There were reports from CNN early on that so goes the third in Minnesota, so goes the nation. I don't know if I buy that. CNN tends to exaggerate. I mean, we no. probably agree. Come on. No. Come on. It's Facebook. We get away with that kind of stuff. Any hoosies. What I was about to say is that race was really expensive. We can agree on that. And one thing I wanted to ask all of you as informed people is that the amount of money being spent in Minnesota meant that you saw more political advertisements this election than you have ever seen before. And I'm not talking a little bit more, I'm talking 10 times more than you have ever seen before. What did it feel like to have the onslaught of ads, John? Uh, exhausting. I think most of us, I only really watch uh, cable television on Sundays for football Thanks games. Thanks a lot, John. My kids will never eat, but that's right. fine. Right, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, John, yeah, I the 18, The 18 to 25 year olds really don't help you out, but they will, they'll get there. Never have. Yep. Uh, but anyway, only time I really see them, Sundays, and it's it's not one, it's five in a row. It, they, it's just a one after another, and sometimes they'll switch sides. Um, but it's just it's taxing. You know, I, I everyone in the room would just groan after the third one. You know, and it doesn't matter. That's people on both sides of the aisle. That's true. That's I don't true. know. Those ads are effective. That's why they pay for them because yeah. it shows that it, they do work. On who? I don't know. The same people hog well, some other commercials that uh, the audience are, are geared to still work um, because really it's just uh, the attack ads. They don't even a lot of countries don't have them. I found out America's kind of unique in that way where you'll really attack the per personally. And, you know, a lot of people don't believe it as much as they used to those ads anymore. Everything's exaggerated, right. you know, and you, it, they put the little sources in there. But I don't believe it on either side. 
even as a conservative. Well, we are going to get back to this, but we're going to go to someone who rarely does a negative political ad, who has an acceptance speech to give, and that is Senator Amy Klobuchar. And our next Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan. And based on what we're seeing across the That's country, right. it looks <laughs> as though the United States House of Representatives will soon be the People's House of Representatives. And the one race that we know that was called already, that will include in the third district, Dean Phillips. So, I think, DFLers, we have learned a lot over the last two years since that last election. You know what happened in that last election. The Midwest was left behind. Minnesota, it wasn't an easy race that night. But guess what? In 2018, Minnesota is roaring back to say, we are one Minnesota. That is what we are because the ballot was more than a ballot this election. There were big stakes and big choices and bigger ideals. Minnesotans, it is early, but it appears to me that Minnesotans voted our dreams and not our fears. We voted for common sense and not blistering words. We voted for getting things done and not gamemanship. And we voted for substance instead of subtweets. We voted for the way politics can be, should be, and with your help will be. And guess what? As we look at, and there are going to be some really tough outcomes tonight, I'm warning you across the country. Some of my good friends in the Senate, it's going to be a tough night. But then there are going to be these moments of victory that are unbelievable. Like maybe you didn't notice, but we just won with a woman candidate. We beat Chris Kobach for the governorship of Kansas. We did that. We won the governorship in Illinois. We did that. So you are going to see races like Dean's all across the country. Now the work begins. And we're going to see from, hear from a lot more candidates tonight, but I want to tell you what I think we need to do. We have to stand up not just for those who voted for us, but for those who didn't, and for those who stayed at home who were tired of the divisiveness in our politics. Because whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent, we are all Minnesotans and we are all Americans. Right now, and you see this when you look at some of the things going on across our country, many people have lost faith in our democracy. And I get why that is. If you turn on TV, it is a pretty much a non-stop shout fest between the left and the right when what we should really be talking about is not what right and left, but what's right and wrong. And we, when we hear- All right, that is Senator Minnesota Amy Klobuchar giving her acceptance speech tonight. She will return to Washington, D.C. We want to check a couple of the other races. Obviously, the governor's race is important, but we want to check the attorney general's race. We haven't seen that one yet. Here's what we're looking at right now, panel. We have collective yeas and groans, so we've got all sides represented here. It looks like Keith Ellison is leading with 56%, but it is really, really early. This, I can't see that far, but there's just a little bit more than 20% of the precincts reporting. So we just wanted to give you an update on this. I know this is one a lot of people have been talking about, and we were just talking about divisive political ads, right? Right before we went to see Senator Klobuchar's speech, and that race probably was the ugliest of them all with the ads coming in between each other. Margaret, Nancy, uh, maybe Nancy, I'll start with you. Margaret had such a great ending last time around. The, you know, what do you think? Do these, these nasty ads really help or? Well, I watch a fair amount of um, 
TV. I'll just admit it. And I am on um, Care 11 NBC almost every day for something. And um, I had gotten to the point where I was going, and you were zapping I, well, zapping it because <laughs> I'd seen enough and I've and I'd heard enough. And I got to hand it to Amy Klobuchar. She had a great ad about courage and what it means to stand up to someone you don't necessarily agree with. And we all know who I'm talking about. And she came out shining. What do you think about it? Renita, you've talked a lot about how you kind of crossed the aisle in your conversations, Democrats, Republicans. When you saw the divisiveness of the campaign, but the ads in general, you know, I'm in news, and so I would watch them during the show I would be working on, and I'm, I've wondered, do these work? Not for me, um, and I think for a lot, a lot of Minnesotans, a lot of Americans, um, especially this midterm election, there have been a lot of educated voters out there. So in the past where I think we were not as dialed into politics, I believe in the last two years, so many of us have tapped into the issues that are important and really started to become educated about the process and legislation that's out there. So we also started to become very educated about who was running, who was on the ballot, who did we want to see elected to go to represent us. So um, ads for me did nothing. Um, because again, I knew that I got to know candidates personally. I also got very engaged in asking the right questions that were important for me on the issues. Um, so when I saw ads, I tuned out because I knew better. I was more educated. Um, and, and so I think a lot of more folks were. Um, but I would say to candidates, if you're running ads that are negative, a lot of us are tuning them out. That's just my thought. One thing I want to dip into, and this is on the national level and on the state level, we are seeing more women running for office than we ever have before. And I would ask the two men on the panel, what does that mean to you as a voter, if anything? I couldn't care less who runs for office. It doesn't matter to me. If you're a qualified person to run for office and you fit the parameters within the Constitution of the United States, run for office. Whether you want to put yourself through the problem of running through office, having worked on a campaign all summer long, it's exhausting. You don't sleep. You don't eat. You don't know what town you're in. But anybody that has the gumption to stand up, present themselves to the American people and say, I want to represent you in this constitutional republic, God bless them, I don't care. I've seen powerful women. I met Margaret Thatcher when I was stationed in Berlin. I didn't meet her, I stood in attention in front of her and I was scared to breathe because if I had something wrong, I could have got dinged in an inspection, inspection but that's military. However, I want to touch back on what John said about your talking about the ads. Know the candidates, get to know the candidates because it's, I got to take a shower after those ads. I don't want to watch them. I, I get out, I educate myself. Like Renita said, get out and meet the people. Know them, listen to them speak because watching a 30 second ad, getting a mailer, what's that going to tell you? It's not going to tell you anything. So like John said, inform yourself. And like Renita said, go out and meet the people. Otherwise, you're not doing yourself or the country any favors. John, I think you're the youngest member on our panel. Possibly. And, 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 yeah, possibly. I think that, you know, your generation is seeing something different and you will see more women running for office and you will see more people of color running for office. What does that mean to the younger demographic? Uh, like Kevin said, it's about the person. You know, I don't think their uh, gender or ethnicity really has, has anything to do with my vote. And personally, I'd like to see it because it's a it's a good thing that you know more women in you know an ideal world it would be 50 50 um but i i don't like it when it's used as a selling point to voters correct you know when they say well you know like when it's checking boxes like a woman minority that's what we want to run because that appeals to people and it's like well the candidate and their beliefs and their honesty and their integrity that's what should appeal to people so when you when you treat people's gender on the ballot as a as an issue to decide on it just feels kind of wrong like hillary clinton and you know um, a lot of times she'd finish after something saying like as a woman i feel like that even turned off a lot of women because they don't they don't want to be told how to vote just because this democrat is a woman you know and then yeah trump won uh white women voters at least by 2%. And I feel like Hillary Clinton could have done better with women if she didn't make it such a selling point, to be honest. It turns a lot of independents off. Like, we want to hear about where you're coming from and who you are, not just not the more ir irrelevant, I'd say. Women, Especially do you in agree the with that? Race. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I disagree. Okay, the As women. Well. The women. I have to let um. the women type in. 
And I hear what you're saying. And Kev, I mean, like Kevin said, just speak the truth and then you don't have to remember what you said. And so yeah. I want, you know, qualified representation, but I want representation. And for me, I don't feel like I have representation in our government right now. And so for me as a woman, that is important. That someone is a woman. Uh, Ren yes, Renita, you want to chime woman. in? I got one minute left. I got one. Of Kevin, you got to talk. I got to let Renita talk. I, I, I absolutely respect your position, John, on how you feel about that. But when we do look at the state of our politics and representation, we have less women. And that is why you have seen more women come forward because I think who are more better qualified to speak on the that issues is that impact thing, women. As I said. And yeah. so in, in order for us to have a seat at that table and be able to make decisions and be involved in those discussions, you need women at the table. So we aren't saying check the box because we're women. We're saying have more women because our voices are missing from the conversation today. This is getting good. John, you've got 15 <laughs> seconds. And uh, yeah, that's completely fair, but I don't feel like that's where it's going exactly. That's not the argument I hear when I hear people give that pitch. It's more like, coming from, it's more polarizing, I'd say. It, it's not as diplomatic as you just put it there. No, not at all. So, yeah. Well, that's why Renita's running in 2020, John. <laughs> <laughs> Heard it here first on uh, Facebook Live. <laughs> all right, let's go back to Chris. Chris. Wow, thank you, Jana, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, so I'm getting some news right now, conflicting reports that from the New York Times said that 10 of the 23 uh, seats needed for Democrats to flip the House are in, but NBC is calling that the House is going to be in Democratic control, which is huge news uh, for Democrats out there. But we wanted to look at the governor's races real quick. If we can be, let's switch to this full screen here. This is the Associated Press website. Tim Walls is, uh, oh, okay, so we got it on full screen. Tim Walls leading 60% to 36 over Jeff Johnson right now. That is a huge lead with 25% of the precincts reporting. But we also want to go over to the Wisconsin race here and take a look at the governor race there. So you have Tony Evers up against uh, the incumbent Republican Scott Walker. You have it dead even for the most part right now. What do you got? Four, 4,500 votes right now splitting this? Unbelievable. With 41% of the precincts reporting, that is neck and neck in a tight race in Wisconsin. And if we look, boy, I want to show some of this real quick. Can we flip to the Associated Press website right here? Okay, look at this. See the southwest part of Wisconsin right here? All these counties were Trump counties down here in the southwest part. A lot of them went for Obama uh, uh, six years ago. But as of two years ago, a lot of these counties went to Trump, and you're starting to see them flip blue right now. So that's an interesting change from uh, just two years ago. Super interesting. So that is neck and neck. Oh, boy, that's going to go late into the night, I'll tell you what. Actually, Associated Press just did an update here, and Tony Evers took a, uh, another two-point lead here. So it's 51-47 with another couple hundred thousand votes that were just put in there by the Associated Press. So a three-point margin there in Wisconsin uh, and another close race in Minnesota. So we're going to kick it back to our panel with Randy and Julie. We're going to come back here for an additional half hour of local coverage so you can get that before our 10 o'clock news. It's been a pleasure. Stick with us. You can watch us on your phone. we got YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, care11.com. we got it all handled. All right, let's switch it over now, and then we'll see you guys in a little bit.
Welcome back. Thanks for staying with our coverage of midterm elections 2018. Lots has happened in the last half hour here in Minnesota, around the state, and also in Wisconsin. And we want to toss to uh, District 5 winner tonight, Ilhan Omar. She is speaking right now. We want to get to that. Omar winning her uh, District 5 race tonight against Jennifer Zielinski, 78% to 22%. And uh, we are standing by waiting for her to speak tonight. Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Sievert has been covering the Dean Phillips win tonight. Let's go to Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Randy. Such a big moment here. Everybody is still trying to process what just happened. That for the first time since 1961, such a historic moment, Phillips has flipped this congressional seat for, for the first time. Now, I'm just hearing, sorry, that he's about to arrive any minute. And actually, some of his volunteers told me that he uh, worked until 8 p.m. He was knocking on doors and, and working to still secure votes until 8 p.m. tonight, so he hasn't arrived here. And some of the volunteers said that's just the kind of guy he, he is. I talked to some teachers who say they've never been activists before until they met Phillips. They said he's a real person, that he listens, and they trust him to reach across the aisle and listen to his constituents. Look, I think he's coming, guys, so stay tuned here. Everyone's cheering. Hi. I think he's coming, but maybe they're just talking to us. I'm not sure. Well, we'll come back <laughs> we'll to you, Lindsay, guys for sure. Uh, we do know. Uh, that Eric Paulson did give a concession speech just a short time ago. He, of course, was a Republican incumbent in that district. Let's hear from him. It's been an honor to represent you in Congress, and I am so appreciative of your support and friendship here tonight. God bless all of you. God bless Minnesota. Well, obviously, earlier in the evening, uh, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Senator incumbent won her race uh, rather easily over Jim Newberger, and here's what she had to say tonight. We voted for the way politics can be, should be, and with your help will be. All right, there you see again uh, the results in the 3rd District, Dean Phillips winning over Eric Paulson. In the U.S. Senate's uh, special election, Tina Smith leading Karen Housley 59 to 37 percent, less than 30 precincts reporting, so still a ways to go in that race. And what else do we have? We have the governor race. And this race as well, again, we want to report just 27 percent of precincts reporting right now, but right now Tim Walls leading with 59 percent and Jeff Johnson at 37 percent. Of course, it always depends on which precincts are reporting. So it's important to keep that in mind while these numbers continue to roll in. And we're going to look next at the attorney general race. Keith Ellison running against Doug Wardlow. Ellison, of course, leaving his seat in the 5th District to run for attorney general. He has 55% of the vote to Doug Wardlow's 40%. So obviously lots of big races, lots of numbers still coming in. And unfortunately, not enough time to talk to <laughs> Catherine or uh, Mr. McClung, but we'll get to them when we come back in our next cut in as we head into our newscast at 10 o'clock. We're going to send it back to NBC News and uh, we'll see you at 10 o'clock for our full half hour of news coverage of tonight's elections. is crushing it. Look, that's you, Rena. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to uh, our Facebook live streamcast here. We want to keep bringing you local results. Uh, from local races in Minnesota. You also have the ability to turn that TV on and watch NBC News too because all the results are starting to come down. And uh, one of the things, well, hi, Rena. Hi, Chris. What have you been up to? No, I, you know what? I've been, uh, I've been doing a lot of things, just running around the newsroom, kind of paying attention to what's going on and, and working on other things, waiting for things to break. It's starting to come right now. I mean, they're starting to get called right here. And what's interesting is uh, 
And B, can we can we pull up the computer over here? We want to show you guys something. Uh, the races that are called first are always in the closest proximity to the state capitol. Isn't mm -hmm. that interesting? And I don't know if it's a matter of getting votes there or not. If we can call up the computer for a second here, I just want to show some of the latest on, uh, here we go, on uh, some of these races. So here's the three that have been called already, right? Dean Phillips, we talked about that one. Ilhan Omar called for that one. But here's the new one. So the Associated Press is now calling Betty McCollum the winner over Greg Ryan by a, an overwhelming margin. That is a huge one. That is a huge one. That one doesn't surprise me. I'll be honest with you. The Dean Phillips being called so early did surprise me. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that was one of the ones that were supposed to be one of these tight national races. That's right. why you saw that flood of ads coming from uh, all those packs. And um, just goes to show that polls, you know, what do, you, what, what do we know? Oh, you know what? I learned the last time in the last election that uh, the polls are, are really something you can't judge a race by. And the Ilhan Omar, and I know you've been talking about all this all night, but... Uh, that one, not a surprise that she won, but not it is a historic moment for her, uh, and it is a historic moment for uh, for Muslims. Absolutely, uh, she's first what first Muslim woman in, in the U.S. Congress, I believe. First, first, and there's yes. another one that's up as well. Uh, in the election somewhere else yeah somewhere else. Correct. so uh, she's actually speaking right now so can we can we pipe in there real quick and, and take a listen but you all know i did not run to be a first i ran because i came to this country i heard of its promises and when i looked around this district to see Many who have never known the bounty of the American promise. The promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This country is supposed to be the land where people have the tools necessary to, leave, to lead a life that is prosperous. Yet, indigenous people promised homes are living in tents like refugees in their own land. <laughs> Millennials promise the American dream if they study hard enough only to find that dream deferred by the harsh realities of our economy. Immigrants promise the land of opportunity are too often met with bigotry and hate. I could not stand by on the sidelines and watch those promises go unkept. My grandfather, my grandfather taught me that when you see injustice, you fight back. You do not give in to sorrow. You do not give in to sadness. You organize and you build with people. I would not be here tonight without my people. My family, my father, who is probably lost somewhere in the sea, You've been listening to Ilhan Omar, uh, the first Muslim woman elected to Congress, uh, a victory speech. It's fantastic news for her, obviously, and for all the people that voted for her. Dean Phillips actually speaking now, so let's take a listen to what he has to say on his win tonight. Throughout our country, who heeded that wake-up call to participate in the very hard and important work of democracy. And from the very beginning, from the very beginning, ours was a campaign built on the power of we, not me. So, so I begin with heartfelt thanks to the most amazing campaign staff ever assembled in any race, in any city, in any country, in the country. My campaign staff. They are my family and I love them. To, to Clara, to, to my mother, Dee Dee, 
my late fathers, Artie and Eddie, who are in my heart. My brothers, Tyler and Jay. My sister, Hutton. My amazing daughters, Daniela and Pia. And Pia, first time voter today. And, and to my extraordinary partner, Annalise. Without whom, come here. W without whom, I never would have undertaken this mission and certainly would never have succeeded. And without All right, so you're listening to Dean Phillips, the Democrat who just beat out Eric Paulson, the Republican incumbent in District 3. We're going to hop back over to Ilhan Omar because you're in bonus coverage on Facebook Live right now, so we'll try to get you as much as possible. As the time demanded it. A time when racism and white supremacy threatens our very existence, when my status as an immigrant black Muslim woman means that the current administration does not see me as an American. You know I will not bow down. You know I will not back down to fear and hate. I will stand strong with you. And as we fight to protect our immigrant families, our neighbors, our children, our planet, our communities, I promise to always have your back. So our state is very cold. But the people have warm hearts. This estate has always made me feel like I was part of a family. Because here in Minnesota, we don't only welcome immigrants, we send them to Washington. <laughs> Again, you've been listening to Ilhan Omar. We're popping back and forth between uh, speeches, victory speeches in this case, uh, just because we're waiting to hear what people have to say. We popped into Dean Phillips. He was just kind of thanking people at the time, so we didn't want you to miss anything that Ilhan Omar was saying. But we're going to pop back into Dean Phillips now, uh, winner in the third district, to see what he is saying, uh, thanking all the people that voted for him. Yeah, then we have some big news uh, coming from Texas and some big news when you're looking at the macro of U.S. and Congress and how those are flipping. We'll cover that in a second. Let's pop back into Dean. America. I love you. <laughs> and I remind you, everybody, tonight is not an end. It is a beginning. It is not a victory. It is an opportunity. In the, words, in the words of the 19th century French diplomat, Alexis de Tocqueville, <laughs> I had to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> and I see my high school teacher, Steve Johnson, in the room. <laughs> I, and I quote, de Tocqueville said, I quote, the greatness of America lies not, lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. And that is why, and that is why I've spent the last two years driving the district in my government repair truck. It is why when they went low, we stayed positive. And, and when they went deceitful, we went truthful. And when they called us a mob, we flash mobbed. <laughs> we demonstrated that by working together, engaging in conversation with our neighbors, and listening to those whose life experiences and perspectives differ than our own, we can, we can overcome hatred and divisiveness and tribalism and begin the work of repairing our faults as a nation and as individuals. Yet winning an election, yet winning an election is not enough. We have serious and very hard work to do to repair our politics in this country, to end the culture of corruption in Washington, 
to bring people back together and make meaningful progress on the major challenges that face our country. That will be my mission every single day as your next member of Congress. But, but I can't do it alone. What we have built together is extraordinary. And it's just a beginning. We've got to stay engaged. We've got to promote conversations and extend invitations, particularly to people with whom we may not agree. We need to get to come together more often and learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. Because change is going to start right here, my friends. Because All right, so we're listening to Dean Phillips there, who just won that race. And we wanted to take a look at some of the other congressional districts in Minnesota that haven't been called yet. There are four that are still up for grabs. Some are extremely tight. Some are... Not so tight. So <laughs> <laughs> let's look at this one. This is uh, District 8, where Pete Stauber is up by Joe uh, Radonovich. And it's 58 to 37. So this is, I mean, it's really a whooping right now, but there's only 22%, if you will, precincts reporting. A lot still to come in over there up in District 8. Do you want to take a look at District 7? Yeah, District 7 right now, Colin Peterson leading. Uh, 52 to 47, this is still really close. And again, when you get uh, farther out of the metro, it takes a little longer for those precincts to report. So we got to bus them in? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they're <laughs> quite that rural. But 22% uh, uh, precincts reporting there. But again, Colin Peterson leading in the 7th district. And this is where they get extremely tight. Look at this right now. So this is District 1. We talked about this where Congressman Walls, who was vying to be governor, uh, vacated that seat, and now you have Jim Hagedorn and Dan Fian uh, fighting for that seat. 20% reporting, but you have, help me with the math, uh, one tenth of a percent difference there? Is that, yeah, one oh, tenth of a percent? Oh, I don't do math. It's just close, my friend. That's, that's enough, to, <laughs> that's I mean, enough for me. No, yeah, that's 40 votes. That is a 40 vote difference right now with Jim Hagedorn up by one tenth of 1%. When people oh say their goodness. vote doesn't count, it's the, in races like this where you have to see how very, very close it is and to know that every single vote counts. That's unbelievable. It really That's is. That's a 40-vote margin. Okay. I'm not sure what precincts they're reporting in there right now, but let's check in on District 2. District 2, this is another hotly contested race, right? Angie Craig versus Jason Lewis. Uh, Jason Lewis is second term in Congress. Right now, 50% precincts reporting, and it is 50 wow. to 49. Wow. 50 to 49. Angie Craig leading at this point, uh, again, just by a couple hundred votes. And with 50% reporting there. Okay, so that's pretty big, and we visited these before, right? So Betty McCollum won District 4. So over here, Ilhan Omar won District 5, and Dean Phillips won District 3. And then we reported that Tom Emmer, uh, the incumbent, won District 6. So those are called already. We're still waiting on four. Should we take a look at Wisconsin for a second? Because people were asking about the governor's race in Wisconsin. You can. While you're clicking on that, I want to tell people that NBC is reporting nationally that Democrats have taken control of the House while Republicans have held the Senate now. So we will see at least some change in power uh, in Congress at this point. So what we still have a Republican president. Right. We will have a Republican Senate. But we will have a Democratic House. So that will change how things work out there. It changes everything. It changes everything because they're going to have to work together now. To pass anything. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Do we say this all the time? Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Can I reverse that? Can I rewind? All right, let's go over to Wisconsin for a second. Uh, we're going to take a look at the governor's race here. And this is super interesting because, again, this one is incredibly tight. And you saw polls going both ways before, uh, before Election Day with uh, some having Evers up by one point or two points and some having Scott Walker up, depending, um, with the margin of error. But here we have 824,000 to 805,000. So what we're looking at is Scott Walker is losing by about 1.2 uh, percentage points right now. Still a lot to be called here. How many do we have reporting in this in uh, Wisconsin right now? 60% of the precincts reporting. We're getting closer in that one. Yeah, super. You know what's interesting is this right here, right? You worked in Milwaukee, correct, Rena? I did. Okay. So here's Milwaukee County. I grew up in Ozaki in the southern tip right here. Milwaukee went for Evers, but this is the interesting county. It's Kenosha. Right, so this is where that big Foxconn project was, and mm -hmm. Boyd was talking with this, uh, talking to me about this too, and people weren't too happy there. This was a Republican district, right? And people weren't too happy there with how Scott Walker had rolled out and and taken the land for that big Foxconn project, and now you can see by a decent margin, 
Tony Evers won. He was winning. Well, with people, 97%, he won. People are voting with um, their hearts, I believe, in this midterm election. They're, they're seeing what's happened over the last two years. Whether you like what's happened, whether you dislike what's happened, but you're actually seeing people going out and voting this time. And I think uh, we're going to have a huge turnout when this is all done. Absolutely. Unbelievable. Here, let's, let's hop into a national race real quick because... Um, in Texas. In Texas, because this is huge, right? So we're talking about Senator Ted Cruz. Right. He wins it. He won it. And this was this was one of those that they thought could be a, a toss up. So a total and it was. Beto O'Rourke uh, was. was a was a decent challenger for Ted Cruz, but they have already called that. So fifty one to forty eight percent. Look at that. About it's surprising that they're able votes. to call it that soon because still, even in that race, there's only thirty seven percent of precincts reporting. But yeah. Ted Cruz wins uh, wins his seat again. Wow, that's a that was a really highly contested race. So we're not going to dip into that too much here. Let's take a look at some of the governor's race in Minnesota, which we need to check back in on, okay? Um, wow, here you go. Tim Walls still has a resounding lead over Jeff Johnson right now. And this is not what the polls had said. Uh, this is a much larger lead than we have seen. Um, wow, especially when you look at the outer counties, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we're talking about the 2016 presidential race, it was blue in here. And everything outside of that, as far as congressional districts, all went red. So it's interesting to see some of these counties voting blue now uh, for the gubernatorial race. And you have to wonder how much Tim Walz's background and history plays a role in this, right? So he's not your typical Democrat. I mean, he served in the Minnesota National Guard for, like, a long time. He's a football coach. He was a teacher. He's, he's run and won in the first congressional district down here as a Democrat. So I think he has some qualities that probably appeal perhaps to the other side. Well, I think this was an interesting race again because our current governor vacating the seat, not running again, so uh, really opens things up. It's different than when you have an incumbent that is running again. So this was going to be an interesting race no matter what, but mm -hmm. it's certainly still too close to call at this point. I want to point out the, the Karen, Ho uh, Karen Housley, Tina Smith race. Yeah, let's Also take a look. too close to call at this point. Let's take a look. Um, and of sure. course, we, Amy Klobuchar was called long ago. Yeah, sixty-four percent of the vote at I, this point. I think they called Amy Klobuchar yesterday. <laughs> they did. They possible. did. I mean, do, do we have the social media post? Can we play the social media post? So, <laughs> State Representative Jim Newberger was the Republican challenger of Amy, of Amy Klobuchar. Here, why don't you take the wheel? And was He's it this morning or yesterday? Was it this morning or yesterday? I can't remember. I think it might have been but Sarah was of Jim Newberger put this incredible Twitter post out there, and you got to kind of see it to believe it. But he 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 does he does something. I don't want to give it away yet because we're going to show you. But he does something that's just fascinating. So this is his tweet. I think it's from yesterday or today. Jim Newberger. He says, "Amy Klobuchar sides with the extreme this November sixth. Don't let the mobs win. Vote jobs, not mobs." But then he posts this video. Take a look. Just watch. He's saying something right now. We can't really hear. It. Is the you have the volume right there? That would be gasoline. And that's a lighter. And what sets the camera on fire? But watch this thing go. I mean, I mean, you, what? This, <laughs> Rena, you react. <laughs> I don't know what well, I'll be honest with you, I can't hear anything. So I don't think I don't he was saying anything, was he? I don't, I don't even know, know, know if he was saying know. anything. But this is official Twitter account, and this is somebody posting this, uh, burning it, burning it down. Wow. Okay. Well, there you go. That's well, the I message, think his perhaps. point is is that someone someone that would vote. I think what he's trying to say is that someone who would vote for Amy is as extreme as someone who would set his sign on fire. Don't you think that's what the message was? There? Now that I've watched it all the way through. <laughs> I think I can understand that now. So the extreme was the person lighting the sign on yes. fire. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, I'm not like a political strategist or anything. I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, I'm not an arson strategist. <laughs> I am definitely not an arson strategist. So. Well, let's take a look at how uh, Newberger and Klobuchar did. If we take this full right now, so this is the Secretary of State's website, and we're looking at the statewide 
results for both of the U.S. Senate races, which is obviously odd again, right? You, you run for every six years, and because we had Senator Al Franken vacated that seat, we have the special election now between Tina Smith and Karen Housen. By the way, Tina Smith way up at this point. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. How many people are, okay, this is 39% in right now. We have 65 of 87 counties reporting. Um, She's winning 57% to 38% wow. at this point. Wow, yeah, and she was appointed by the governor into that Senate role. And, and, and didn't have a lot of time there to necessarily establish a record right. or, or, you know, to make a name for herself. So, right. um, you know, essentially two new people coming into this, even though she is the incumbent in that race. And she had said that she was going to rerun in two years anyway, because mm -hmm. that's when that seat is actually up. So that's interesting. You want to pop back over to, uh, let's pop back over to the governor race real quick because that's tight and I want to check on uh, Craig. By some micro local races, we still don't have the Hennepin County Sheriff yet at this point. So um, we're looking we're looking for someone to call that here and uh, we'll get that information to you as soon as we can. And of course we have a 10 o'clock newscast coming on uh, in about eight minutes. So you'll have uh, all the latest information there as well. Time flies when results are coming in. All right, let's take this. <laughs> So this is for governor, right? And Walls. Oh, they called it. Did they? They just called it. They just called yeah. it. The Associated Press Done. has just called the gubernatorial race for Tim Walls. Tim so Walls Congressman, is your new governor. Congressman Walls is now Governor Walls. And Jeff Johnson, who had a strong campaign, he uh, was down in Rochester. I got a chance to meet him and talk to him uh, about his campaign issues and about his support for President Trump. And uh, he was on stage that night in Rochester. Did you feel like this race was one where they didn't necessarily go low? That both candidates, I feel like, um, I, I don't know, they, they kept a respect for each other anyway? Uh, it just felt like Johnson this was... Walls? Yes. yes. I felt like this yes. was one of the races that was uh, yes. civil. Absolutely. Yeah, no, totally. And you, you could see it when they were debating each other. They never crossed a certain line. No. They, if anything, it was a very Minnesotan, like, I'm not going to raise my voice, but I'll say that I'm... I'm, uh, I'm not feeling what you're putting out right now. But Absolutely. There was nothing dirty, and, even and in the I feel like that's too. something that's missing in, in politics right now. It's just it's nice to see that these two people who philosophically disagreed on uh, right. many things were able to at least be civil towards each other. It's yeah. a it's a civil discourse is something that we're missing these days. Wow. Absolutely. And I remember uh, I said this earlier in our stream. I remember Tim Walls's very first debate. It was down in Austin, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and he was running for the first congressional district. And Representative Gil Gutnick had held that had held that for like I don't know how many six eight terms. One hundred and four terms. One hundred and forty terms. The guy's one hundred eighty <laughs> years old. He didn't get started until he was forty. <laughs> anyway, Tim Walls was a rookie. He was a teacher who had yeah. served in the guard, and they were debating in this little thing. And I, everybody thought, oh, Walls held his own in that debate, and there he is now, your next governor of Minnesota, by a resounding twenty point lead. I don't think anybody saw that coming that hard right there. So that's interesting. Let's check back in with Congress real quick uh, and see if anything else got called here. Excuse me. Nothing else in Minnesota, it looks like. No, but Stauber has got a firm lead right now. Stauber's got a firm. What's that be? I'm just taking this. Oh, okay. This is still just Ziploc type. Hagedorn is up by 1,200 12, votes over Fee in... in, in Walls' old district there, 26% reporting. Wow. Check back in with Jason Lewis and Angie Craig. 58% uh, of the precincts reporting right now. Look how tight that one still is. Craig's up by two points. Mm -hmm. So those two districts are still waiting to be called. And Peterson, has, his lead has grown a little bit up yeah, to five, five points now with 28% reporting over there. Fascinating. Wow, look at all these results coming in. This is unbelievable. So, um, so much on the line in, in, in this particular election. It's probably, I don't know about you, but it was the most consequential midterm, I think, that I've ever covered. Uh, undoubtedly that I've ever covered, but perhaps since I've been alive. You know, I, the elections are also unique and, and, and some of them even historic. And I, I think back to the 2000 election and how <laughs> the presidential race was just up in the air, two, three o'clock in the morning. We were all still, they finally just said, go home and uh, come back in the morning. We had hanging chads and pregnant chads and chubby chads and chads that, you know, <laughs> robbed banks. I don't know. But, it, you know, each, each election is historic 
and yeah. significant. And I know we always say that, but uh, this midterm, it's not usually, you don't usually talk about too much about a midterm. And so I think this was unusual. And I think we're going to find uh, probably a record turnout. Minnesota always has great turnout for elections anyway, but we were on pace uh, to, to set some records here, even with the uh, early ballots that were turned in. We were near the 2016 presidential election with the amount of uh, absentee ballots uh, that were or early ballots that were turned in. Wasn't that unbelievable? It is. It's unbelievable. It really is. I've never seen again, and it, you know there are motivating factors and motivating parties right now, and it goes all the way down into local races. Take a look at this. What do we got? So this, these are results oh, just this in. Oh, this is the sheriff. Uh, Hennepin County, County sheriff. sheriff. So we have Dave Hutch, who is has a 50.1 percent lead over Rich Stanick, who is the incumbent. He's the sheriff right now of Hennepin County with 49.3. You have less than one percentage point, which equates to 5,000 votes in Hennepin County. 5,000 vote difference right now between those two. Unbelievable. Wow. We're almost all the way in on that one, too. Oh, my goodness, 40, yeah. 404 of 422 precincts. That's like 95%, 96% reporting there. And then uh, in our other... This is over in Ramsey County. We've got Bob Fletcher. And Jack uh, Sarir, I believe, is, is, I've been able to talk to Jack a few times, and he's up, again, this is so tight right now. He's up 50.1 to 49.1. It's a one-point margin right now for Sheriff. Wow. I never thought that Sheriff's races were this close. Everything's close these days. It's I said, geez. <laughs> it's unbelievable. All right. So we got about uh, two minutes before we're going to toss it over to CARE 11 News at 10. Uh, One know? last check on that Jason Lewis, Angie Craig okay, uh, race for me. And while you're talking about that, wanted to quickly oh, talk Angie about. Oh, Angie Craig bumped up a little bit. She's bumped she, up yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Voting for judges, I don't know if you noticed, but not a one only like t one of them was running Race. unopposed. Yeah. So. So what do you do? Fill, I don't know. That's a little bit, well, I don't know. Do you or do we need more people to? I mean, it all starts in the courtroom, right? Every case that's heard is heard by a judge. Yes. I think, you know, and I saw a remarkable piece out of KSC in Denver, it's yeah. one of our Tegna partners, about how you prepare for judges. Like, you don't ever hear about how judges are doing. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult for the average citizen to go home and want to research how a particular judge is doing in, a, in an appeals court or whatever. So maybe we need to do a story on that, about how people can be more informed about judges. I was races. fascinated by yeah. that. And, and, you know, had there been people that were running against each other, I'm not sure I would have known who to vote for. And I do this for a living, right, you know. Right, so I think right. it's something that we just, it's on a micro level we need to get more involved in. Absolutely. All right, we're almost out of time. What do we got, 30 seconds left? Should we toss it? All right, so um, CARE 11's Facebook page, CARE 11's YouTube page, CARE 11's Twitter, CARE11.com. We're listening to you. If you want to type in questions, we still have our expert panel uh, that's going to be on CARE 11 News at 10. So we're taking your questions down and we're submitting them to them. So if you want something specific answered, please chime in and let us know. And we'll be happy to give it over to our experts. Great job, by the way, tonight. Oh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it's like it. three hours of continuous coverage. Yeah, I'm sweating in places. I don't want to be sweating. <laughs> I got uh, too much Diet Coke, oh. and it might not be over. There you go. It might not be over. <laughs> so my face might look like a raisinette by the time uh, we're done here. Go in November, by the way. I see that. I've noticed it for That's the last right. couple it's of days. It's not like a fashion statement. It, you know, we're really trying to raise awareness for uh, testicular, prostate cancer. I know uh, a couple of... Um, a couple of uh, things that you care deeply about. We're talking about mental health and, and uh, suicide. Historic midterm election night in Minnesota. So many tight and closely watched races. Several of them here in Minnesota, as you can see, have been called.